All right, everyone. All right, it is 2.06 p.m. on this Tuesday, September 24th, 2024, and I would like to call to order this regular meeting of the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees. And now that we've called that to order, uh, Clerk Rodriguez is not able to be with us today, and so JJ will be doing the roll call for us, please. Or Adam, Vice President Mayberry will be. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Trustee Jeff Church. Okay, present. Uh, Vice President Adam Mayberry. Present, okay. <laughs> Trustee Diane Nicolette. Good afternoon. Clerk Rodriguez is uh, excused. Uh, President Smith. Here. And Trustee Colleen Westlake. Here. And Trustee Alex Woodley. Here. Okay, we have a quorum, Madam President. Thank you. Oh, I, I apologize. I, I do want to, uh, uh, on the roll, note our uh, student representative, Calvin Barkosi. Yeah. Okay, thank you. My apologies. Welcome, Calvin. We appreciate having you with us today. So thank you so much. And so it sounds like you're with the Student Advisory Council for the North Valleys High School. So thank you. We're excited to have you as a part of today's conversation. All right, so now we'll move on to item 1.03, our Pledge of Allegiance. So um, as we often celebrate proclamations, moments of recognition, uh, there's a person who you will see time and time again come up and speak to this board and this community from this podium. She speaks with grace. She speaks with inclusion. She speaks with respect. And I know that I always appreciate when she bring, brings forth our students and her perspective. She's been with this district for over 10 years and she's guided us through many conversations and moments that can be uncomfortable and can be challenging. And those are often the ones that we need to be talking about and we need to be dealing with. And so I am personally very grateful for her and for the important role that her and her team play for the Washoe County School District. So Miss Lanisha Battle, our Director of Equity and Diversity, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you so much, Ms. Battle. So now we'll move on to item 1.04, our land acknowledgement. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in the hope of a better life and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We acknowledge that some of our educational structures are situated in the traditional homelands of the Washu, Washo, Nukmu, Northern Paiute, Niwi, Western Shoshone, and Nuwu, Southern Paiute peoples. We pay respect to their elders, past and present. These lands continue to be a gathering place for indigenous peoples, and we recognize their deep connections to these places. We extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn in their territory. Thank you. Now that closes section one and brings us now to section two, our consent agenda items. And prior to today's meeting, I do have a request to pull item 2.12. So I will ask staff to prepare when we hear that item. Um, I am not aware of any other items that have been requested to pull. So I will look and see. And um, Trustee Church, I do see you up there. I will go to you on a regular basis and make sure that you are invited in um, and are able to participate in every instance that you would like. Um, but seeing no lights on, um, we will be considering items 2.02 .02 to 2.11. 
uh, in their entirety because again, uh, 2.12 is what we are pulling. So seeing no lights on, uh, JJ, do we have any public co comment for item 2.12 to 2.11? Uh, I have John Eppolito for consent agenda item 2.15. Is Mr. Eppolito in the overflow room? Oh, okay. Do I need to call for that? I said 2.02 to 2.11, and then I, if you would, yes. Okay. So we also have items 2.13 to 2.15. Well, welcome, Mr. Eppolito. Come on up. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. John Eppolito with Protect Nevada Children. Um, on 2.15 is another million dollars for devices for iPads. Um, last year, you guys approved $6.5 million for the software, and now we're spending another million dollars for the devices. Um, I, I taught for six years, and, and most of us experienced teachers know that this is not the way to teach. I'm surprised Joe doesn't speak up more against this from time to time. At least I've never heard him. Um, it really is a shame. I don't know how many teachers that would hire. That's $7.5 million plus all the other money you've spent for devices, software, data mining. Uh, we've asked the school district, we never get an answer. It's in the tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars wasted on this kind of garbage. Um, we know that would hire a lot of teachers if you could find them. Um, it, it, it's very problematic to me. And the discussion we should be having is should we be spending that kind of money on software and devices? Or should we be trying to improve education the old-fashioned way, like we did when I taught? I don't know. It's almost like you guys have given up. And I've said this before. The scores keep dropping. The kids get out of high school. They can't do math. The software that you spent $6.5 million on, this software, was for math and um, English language arts. The kids, a lot of them, when they get out of high school, they can't really do math very well. English, they can't read very well. They can't write very well and just keep spending more money on the same things that aren't working. I don't know, it's just frustrating. And it's like, I don't know why we don't have those discussions. Um, I thought I'd run out of time, but gosh, I have a lot of extra time. But this is, uh, this is about the email Paul White sent out about the suicide last year of the middle school student. Now, I don't know if they were using district issued devices to bully this girl, but there, it's very problematic. And she begged, supposedly, according to Paul, she begged the principal and the superintendent to get involved because she was getting bullied via social media at school on her phone. Again, I don't know if they were using district-issued devices for this, but it was last school year, and according to this email that Paul sent, it culminated with her getting on social media and taking her own life after the parents reached out to the school district numerous times, supposedly, for help. I was in Carson City when they talked about this anti-bullying bill via social media, and there was a dad there that spoke. His daughter did the same thing. You guys have all these lawyers and 70 or 80 people in IT. I don't know why you couldn't help that family. It's very frustrating. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Epolito. That's all I have. All right, I'll bring it back here. Um, I'm ready to make a motion, Madam President, if I all may. All right, absolutely. I move that the Board of Trustees approves consent agenda items 2.02 .02 through 2.11 and 2.13 through 2.15. Second. All right, we have a motion by Trustee Woodley, seconded by Trustee Nicolette. Seeing no lights on and also looking um, at Trustee Church, seeing no hands. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All right, motion carries six to zero. Thank you so much, colleagues. And now we'll go ahead and we will move forward with item 2.12. This is the approval of the updated memorandums of understanding for dual credit courses and the 2024-25 lists of dual credit courses and additional dual credit courses for Washoe County School District students with the Nevada System of Higher Education Institutions, including the University of Nevada, Reno, 
Truckee Meadows Community College, and Western Nevada College. This is an item now for separate possible action. Um, and we have in front of us uh, our Chief Academic Officer, yes, Troy Parks and Kendra Fox. Um, and I will defer to Vice President Mayberry. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming up. I, I you know, wholeheartedly support uh, this item. Uh, it, it offers so many valuable opportunities for our kids and truly gives them a jump start. And so I, I applaud our continued efforts. Um, this wasn't around when I was uh, in high school, so um, it, it's, it's truly a blessing. I've experienced it with my own children. And the fact that I have a children in high school, I do get some feedback specific to tuition. And so that's what I want to ask about here in front of my colleagues and the public and just for some clarification. Because uh, dual credit, uh, in terms of how it's administered, uh, you could have, as I understand it, a, a Washoe County School teacher teaching a dual credit course on one of our campuses. You could have a college uh, instructor, say TMCC, teaching on our campus as well. You could also have students attending UNR, uh, TMC, uh, uh, some of the other schools that we have in our local agreements with, uh, and they're getting dual credit. And I had asked, and so uh, back it up a little bit, when we approved the budget earlier this year, we included funding to provide a level of equity and cover those costs for our students. And I remember asking the question specifically, does this include, as an example, students that attend a class at TMCC? And the response was to the effect, I, I believe so. So there was a little hesitation there, uh, and I didn't follow it. Maybe I should have. But you know, it comes to find out that not all of these dual credits classes are, in fact, uh, the, the, the tuition is not taken care of by the school district. Um, and and I, so I, I want to get some clarification on what dual credit tuition is paid for by the district and what isn't. Thank you for yeah. your question. Uh, President Smith, uh, Superintendent Ernst, Board of Trustees, Kendra Fox, Director of Secondary Curriculum Instruction for the record. Um, so under the umbrella of a dual credit is our two kind of two pathways. One is what we call concurrent enrollment and one is called dual enrollment. Concurrent enrollment is um, where our instructor is teaching the class. It could be online, it could be on our campus, but our instructor, our, one of our high school teachers who's been approved by the college is teaching the course. Dual enrollment is where a college instructor is teaching the class and it doesn't matter where that occurs. Okay. It could be on our campus, it could be online, it could be on the college campus. So the distinction is really who is teaching the course. Okay. Um, with that distinction is the ones the district is paying for are when our teacher is teaching the course. When a college instructor is teaching the course, that is when we're not paying for it. So we're, cover so we're covering the concurrent classes? Correct. Period. Period. Okay. And I would just, I would just offer this, that, that going forward, we, we, we may want to do just a better job of clarifying that. I know I got some feedback for, from students who, at English 101, as an example, Spanish Springs High School, um, a TMCC instructor teaching it, they assumed it was going to be covered, and they got a bill of about just south of three hundred dollars. So, again, not accusatory, not a criticism. Great program. I just think we need to better crystallize what classes for, for moms and dads and guardians uh, they have to pay for and what the district is covering. Ideally, we will have more concurrent enrollment sure. classes on our campus. That's the goal. Okay. And so then students don't have to worry about dual um, dual enrollment. So that we have this foundation of courses in all of our campuses. So it's really not even, but I agree, we do need to make sure that we're using the right vocabulary. Um, but if we have that foundation on our campuses, then if students wants to, wants to go take a different class on the, on the college campus, they're welcome to do that. But that we have a foundation of courses on our campus so that all students have that access. Thank you. And thank you, can I add to please, Trustee Mayberry? Sure. Um, Appreciate the question, and uh, to build on what Kendra said, uh, we we take ownership of that, that it wasn't clear. 
and we are taking measures, as you might have seen in the superintendent's highlights, we had a memo kind of outlining the differences and exactly what's paid for, what's not. Uh, we've taken and modified that, and recently Kendra sent it out to principals and counselors so that they're getting the word because there is that subtlety that means a big difference in, in dollars, and I do see how our families could be thinking this is going to be paid for, so we are fixing that. Thank you. And I, I think the list is, is phenomenal. We're going to be talking about aviation in a little bit. I saw there was even ground school on that list. So i um, really happy uh, about this program. But, yeah, grateful that, that you recognize that and that we'll correct that going forward. So thank you. Thank you, President Smith. Hi, Kendra. Hi, Troy. I was going to actually turn my light off because you answered the question I was going to ask, but then I decided, no, I said, I'm going to, I, I want to make a statement. I was going to say, well, do we try and get teachers from the district as much as possible to teach these classes? And you guys are so good. You're, you're already doing that. You're already planning to have our teachers teaching these courses. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I would just like to add to it's our college and university partners that are have been so wonderful to work with that they take our teachers um, resume and their teaching history and really try to get as many of our teachers the ability to teach as possible. So it's been a really wonderful partnership. This was a very valuable conversation because I've gotten this question too, so I appreciate you pulling this item so that we could discuss it more. Thank you. JJ, do we have any public comment on this item? We do not. All right. Well, I will bring it back to this board, and I see Vice President Mayberry's light on. Oh, yeah. I'll go ahead and make a motion item, uh, Madam President, to approve item 2.12. Second. Second. All right. We have a motion by Vice President Mayberry, seconded by Trustee Woodley. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All right, motion carries six to zero. Thank you so much, colleagues, and thank you so much, Troy and Kendra. We really appreciate you and your expertise. All right, that closes item 2.12 and section two in its entirety, and we will move on now to section three. These are our items for presentation, discussion, information, and or action. And so that brings me now to item 3.01, the presentation to recognize recent Washoe County School District Police Department special commendations awarded to members of the school police department. This is an item for presentation and discussion and we have with us now Chief Tracy Moore from the school police. And we also have some invited guests with us that I know that we will be introducing um, over time. I know that we have Meredith Williams here from United Federal Credit Union and then also Brandy Ward as well from the United Federal Credit Union. And they're here to help us with some of these celebrations. But first, we'll start with you, Chief Moore. Perfect. Thank you, President Smith, Superintendent Ernst, and trustees. My name is Tracy Moore, your Chief of School Police. Uh, back in August, we had our back to the school uh, staff meeting. And during that time, we have numerous awards that we give out. Some of those are for perfect attendance, years of service, merit, uh, chief's accommodation, and the one we have in there that's probably the highest uh, achieve award is, is a life-saving medal. Uh, planning for this, I was like, man, I better order some more of these medals. There's quite a few to hand out. So with that said, and also during that meeting, I appreciate I opened up the invitation to the trustees, and we had a 100% turnout. So I really do appreciate you all being there to uh, see what this department brings to our community. The first one, uh, Officer Solner, step on up. We'll give you a brief history on this gentleman's uh, training background here shortly. Oh, you come up here by me. Yeah, we'll make him sit in a chair. But on April 16th, Officer Solner was conducting a school check at Des Moines Ranch High School. While in the staff lounge, Officer Solner heard a staff member that sounded as if they were choking. Officer Solner located the staff member and confirmed they were indeed choking as they were pointing to their throat and turning purple. Officer Solner acted immediately and began administering abdominal thrusts, attempting to dislodge the item that was choking the staff member. Officer Solner successfully dislodged the item and continued to monitor the staff member to ensure her airway was not compromised. Because of Officer Solner's quick thinking and actions, Robin K. 
Kenyon, a member of the Washoe County School District family, is with us today. So Robin joined us at the staff meeting, and that's a picture for you. But uh, he's this is uh, his first life life saving melon. He has another one here. We need to flip the page to again, Mr. Busy Man here. <laughs> So on July 31st of 2024, Officer Solner was volunteering at a tip -a cop You got that one, JD? I'm sorry. Same one, right? Okay. It's right here in front of me. While working the event, Officer Solner's attention was drawn to a woman who was seated in the restaurant slumped over in her chair. Officer Solner observed that woman was extremely pale. As Officer Solner approached the woman, he observed that she was unconscious and struggling to breathe. Officer Solner acted with immediacy, repositioning the woman in order to open her airway to assist in her breathing. Officer Solner continued to monitor the woman, ensuring her airway remained open while medics were called. When medics arrived, Officer Solner worked with them and with his experience as a medic, was able to relay the symptoms for them to help determine the appropriate treatment. It was determined the woman was having a diabetic episode, which may have resulted in a cardiac arrest had Officer Solner not acted quickly and efficiently. So kudos to him, uh, he joins us, your former employer was Remza, so we strongly encourage him to keep those skills as hundreds, thousands of hours to continue to be a beneficial member of our community or school district. Also, uh, one thing to point to note is he got the highest tip for the night for that tip of coffee. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> officer. Well, I appreciate uh, the applause, but in a lot of cases, we just end up being at the right place at the right time is what it seems. And I was very grateful to be able to be a part of both of those individuals' lives and the outcome was as optimistic and happy as we all would hope that it would be. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And don't go too far because after we do all of these awards, we will be taking a photo. But to know that two people in our community are alive because of you, it's incredible. And we're not done. Yeah. <laughs> we got you done. And then just so you guys know, in the process of life saving medal, you can barely see that picture, but the officers do receive a ribbon medal they would wear in some kind of formal procedure. Uh, there's also red ribbon. So if you do see the officer with a red square, that means they've received a life saving medal. All right, next one. Scott O'Brien and Detective Richard Miranda. I know they're I saw him here. Rich, come on up. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks for jumping up here. All right, this one's a little bit of a, of a long narrative, so bear with me here as we go through this one. All right, guys. On July 22, 2024, Detective Miranda and Officer O'Brien were at Boca Reservoir wrapping up a day on the water with their families. While waiting their turn to retrieve their boat from the water, O'Brien and Miranda heard screaming coming from a neighboring camp. Miranda immediately ran toward the screaming to assist, and O'Brien followed. As they responded, they were directed to a boat that had just arrived on shore. Multiple subjects were in the boat, including an unresponsive male. The driver of the boat advised the unresponsive male of the boat was his friend, who had jumped from a rope swing into the lake, landing awkwardly. The driver said his friend surfaced, cried for help, then lost consciousness, and was afloat face down in the water for several minutes before they were able to retrieve him. Miranda and O'Brien advised the crowd Sorry, Miranda O'Brien advised the crowd that they had gathered were, that they were peace officers. Miranda O'Brien removed the unconscious male from the boat and placed him on the shore and began administering CPR as he had no pulse and was not breathing. Miranda and O'Brien continued CPR for several minutes while the family members called 911. After a few minutes of CPR, water was expelled from the subject's airway and he was moved into recovery position where they were able to feel a slight pulse and shallow breathing coming from the man. After a short time, a medical unit arrived who transported the man waiting uh, via care flight. The man was flown to Renown where he underwent brain and heart surgeries without a doubt had Miranda and O'Brien not been there to take control without hesitation to administer life-saving measures. The man, Jordan, would not have survived. <clears throat> so gentlemen, good job. Officers, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, they, they, they're pointing to the thank you side. I always say that <laughs> you guys have your chance to also make public comment if you want to about this event. But I'm super proud of you guys and the training you do and you know being there for our community. Thank you, Chief. Anything else, Rich? Scott? I guess it, it just happened yeah, that Rich. we're in the right place in the right time, and I'm glad that O'Brien's with me. He's my assistant, and 
It works. Thank you so much. Yeah, just uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, serve my community. It's kind of a reminder uh, that we are actually never really off duty once mm -hmm. we make that decision to serve the community and you guys and um, people know that and they look to us as those people and expect those actions whether we're in uniform or not. So that's kind of a reminder to me. So that's it. Thank you. And that's it. I just really proud of our troops. The training does pay off. You know, like I say, we, you know, we receive extensive training to protect you all here at the schools and the students that uh, you can see how much it bleeds over into our community. But good job, team members. All right. Um, Chief, I, I know that um, we were also going to be recognizing today um, Sergeant Bo Loritens, but he is not able to be here today. We still thank him so much for stepping in for the role of um, our chief while we were finding you and bringing you as a member of our team. So unfortunately, Mr. Lortens uh, was not able to be with us today, but we do thank him so much. And then I believe we have one more? Yes. Okay. One more in there, and I, I will get you back to your, your meeting there. So we have last uh, last one for you is Officer Holly. She's assigned to the uh, Hug, Hug High School campus. Oh, there you are. I didn't see you sneak in. They stole you from Hug. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. Get over here. All right. On May 10th, Officer Holly responded to an unconscious student in the parking lot of uh, Proctor Hug High School. As Officer Holly responded, she could see a group of students gathered around a vehicle. Upon arrival, Officer Holly observed a student giving rescue breaths to another student who was on the ground. Officer Holly immediately took control of the scene and began administering chest compressions. After several compressions were administered, the student regained consciousness. At that moment, medics arrived on scene and assisted with additional medical care. Officer Holly, without hesitation and without wavering, assisted in saving the life of one of our students. This is something all the students present, whether involved or as a witness, will never forget. Officer Holly, congratulations. Outstanding work. Proud of you. Anything else you want to say? You got your chance to speak. Um, I'm just glad for the opportunity to not just serve our students just at HUG, but also with their safety. You know, I get to see this individual, this student, every single day at school, and it's just kind of an extra bonus to my day knowing that she's here for a reason, I was there for a reason, and I'm just glad I was there. Thank you so much. And so before we take a photo, um, so when this ceremony originally took place, we did share it publicly. And one of our community partners, United Federal Credit Union, immediately saw this story. And they said, we would like to do something to recognize these officers for their work. And so I believe that we have both Meredith and Brandy here with us. If you'd like to come on in and share with our officers and the public, how United Federal is helping to celebrate these officers before we give them a very rounding round of applause and then take some photos. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm not used to a podium, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much. We're on honestly honored to be here, to be part of the recognition for these officers um, and to be here at your board meeting. So thank you for that. And as United Federal Credit Union was the original Reno Teachers Credit Union created 75 years ago, we are a very proud supporter of the school district, partners in education and all the hard work that everybody does here at Washoe County School District. So thank you again for having us. And I applaud these officers and all of them um, going above and beyond. So we do have um, a small token of our appreciation to thank you for what you've done. A certificate from United um, Federal, and we heard, you know, just like most and even my team, they're incented by coffee and food. So we have a couple little gift cards um, for some Starbucks, some Jersey Mike's. Hopefully you guys can have some lunch or coffee on us. Um, you'll each get a gift card to both. And um, again, thank you so much for your service and everything you do. So. Shall I just give it to them? I don't know. <laughs> we, we will in, in just a moment. Okay. Um, and so, um, and of course, any of my colleagues are welcome to join in. When we were all at this ceremony and we saw 
all of the awards that our officers received, various commendations, but the life-saving awards, immediately we knew that these were stories we needed to share with our public. Our school police are incredible. The work that you do, the student-centered policing that you do, the way that you serve our community, both within the schools and outside of it, is truly amazing. And there are people, quite frankly, alive today because you exist. And so it is a tremendous honor to have a police force and department that we have. We say thank you so much, and we're so incredibly honored to have you as a member of our team um, here within the district. And um, seeing no other lights on, we would love to stand and give you a round of applause and welcome you all up for some photos. All right, everyone. All right, we're going to go ahead and continue. Um, make sure we still have Trustee Church with us. Yes, we do.
All right, everyone. All right, we're going to bring this back to order, but not done with the celebrating because we will move on now to another extremely exciting moment, a monumental moment in the history of the Washoe County School District. And with that, I will open item 3.02, the presentation, discussion, and possible action to approve the grant application to the Gillimo Foundation for an aviation technologies program at the Academy of Arts, Career, and Technology, AACT High School for $1,009,350. This is an item for possible action. And we welcome um, with us today a very special guest and a, such an important person that has helped make this vision a reality, Mr. Tom Hall from the Gillimo Foundation, and Jason Maddock, the principal of AACT High School, and Josh Herzog. Welcome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Josh Hartzog here for the record. Um, hello to President Smith and Superintendent Ernst and the rest of the board. It is my immense pleasure and honor and privilege uh, to introduce you to the work that we've been doing as a CTE department with the Gilmot Foundation and to introduce you to, as President Smith said, a very important individual for our department and is going to become a very in uh, important individual for our school district, Mr. Thomas Hall representing the Guillemot Foundation. Mr. Hall is also joined by his fellow board members, Marie uh, Guillemot, who is representing the Guillemot family, as well as trustee Bill Johnson, and they comprise the entirety of the board. Mr. Hall is gonna have a moment to share with you the vision of the work that the Guillemot Foundation is doing with respect to aviation education across our community. But before he does so, I thought it would behoove the board as well as the community to give you a little bit of background information on how we came to this historic event. As President Smith mentioned, we are uh, presenting for your consideration an unprecedented investment in career and technical education of over $1 million to support an aviation technology program. This effort uh, really first began in the fall of last school year, and all the credit in the world goes to Vice President Adam Mayberry, who brokered this first connection, responding to uh, Mr. Hall as one of our constituents and understanding that it would be really important to broker a connection between Mr. Hall and our department. And when we met with Mr. Hall, it became very clear early on that he was representing the George W. Gilmott Foundation and that they were very serious about doing whatever they could to support the expansion of aviation education across our community. This is something that this foundation and his uh, former colleague, Mr. Gilmott, has been committed to over the last several decades. But from that initial conversation, we understood that it would be uh, beneficial for us to engage in a monthly series of planning meetings. Vice President uh, Mayberry was president at several of those meetings, and we appreciate your continued engagement. And at those monthly meetings of the CTE department, we had a variety of community stakeholders, including the University, bless you, including the University of Nevada, Reno, TMCC, the Reno Stead Airport, the Reno Tahoe Airport, a variety of stakeholders talking about what we could do to increase opportunities for students to be exposed to aviation education, and ultimately the variety of career pathways that are available to them in our region, not just in aviation, but also in aerospace. So from those initial monthly meetings in the fall, we asked the Guillemot Foundation if they would be able to fund a labor market study that was ultimately commissioned by the University of Nevada, Reno. I have that labor market study available for your review if you're interested. Um, ultimately, I will be honest, the aviation and the aerospace uh, as an industry, it's not one of our leading industries in the community, um, but it does offer a variety of very compelling career pathways. And that was enough for us to signal that it made sense for us to con continue to move forward. Uh, shortly thereafter, in terms of CTE, we um, collectively came to the consensus that one of the most effective means of increasing students' ability to engage in aviation education would be to establish a new career in technical aviation program um, known as aviation technology. Aviation technology is recognized by the Nevada Department of Education. It can be anywhere from a two to a four year program and it offers a variety of benefits, which I'll speak to here in a moment. But from those ongoing conversations, the CTE program made sense for us in addition to a variety of other efforts that the Guillemot Foundation is supporting across our community. 
From there, we moved on to a series of observational tours, uh, starting with Rancho High School, located in Clark County School District. There is currently, currently, only one aviation technology program across the state of Nevada in high school, and that is in Rancho High School. And we were able to go down there, again, uh, leveraging funding support from the Gilmont Foundation to be able to observe that school. They run a phenomenal program in Rancho High School. We took away a lot of wonderful lessons, which again, I can speak to if you're interested. And then we were also able to fund a team of observers to go up north to Washington to raise Beck Aviation High School, from which we collected a variety of other um, very important lessons that informed our planning moving forward. And then in the spring, it made sense that we wanted to move forward with this. It was just a matter of the site that we selected. And we began to include the Capital Projects Department as well, as we knew that wherever we established this program, leveraging potential funding from the Guillemot Foundation, it was going to have a fairly heavy infrastructure component and retrofitting component. There were a variety of schools which we considered uh, for establishing a new CTE aviation technology program. Um, ultimately, we arrived at the Academy of Arts, Careers, and Technology for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, obviously chosen for its CTE focus. It is a career and technical academy. Also, obviously, for its proximity to the airports and access for students to be able to um, access various industries and ultimately see where their educational pathways would take them. It also cannot be overstated uh, the importance of busing. We knew that if we were going to establish a new aviation technology program, we wanted to be able to provide equitable access and opportunity for students to be able to access this program. So the fact that AACT currently has busing from around our school district was very important. And then lastly, uh, they had a very supportive administration, first with Mike Gifford, principal who is now moving to Debbie Smith, and now with Mr. Jason Maddock, who has his own personal investments in the aviation and aerospace industry as well. Uh, the ins and outs of the actual grant that is for your consideration would be going to fund a variety of core essential activities. Number one, renovating various learning spaces at AACT, which we've identified as most appropriate, developing curriculum, purchasing flight simulators, textbooks, various pieces of equipment that are necessary, uh, drone kits as well, training staff, and then ultimately supporting students and their ability to go on busing tours, not just around the community, but actually outside of the state as well, if that's deemed feasible. If approved, we would be working throughout this year on a variety of logistical functions to make sure that the space and the curriculum is ready um, for a new instructor to come in and ultimately teach this program. AACT is currently running applications for students to uh, get into the program, and they're looking at opening up the program to serve approximately 60 students from grades 9 through 12. And you can see the project goals up there. I won't belabor the point. Um, but ultimately, our intent is to have a fairly substantial base of curriculum resources in place for a new instructor once they would be hired to teach the program next year. So this year, we're looking at a lot of intense, um, efficient work to do what we can to prepare. And before we turn it over to Mr. Hall, I don't think there's anyone else um, better suited to introduce a video here that gives you the ins and outs of the actual curriculum of the program, Mr. Jason Maddock, principal of AACT. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Hartzog. President Smith, Superintendent Ernst, trustees, Jason Maddock, proud principal of AACT High School, um, here to First of all, I'll give a huge amount of gratitude to the Gilmont Foundation, to Josh's team, including Capital Projects representatives, Matt McKay. Uh, shout out to Principal Gifford for his work. Um, I'm just super blessed and grateful to fall into this position as the first year principal at ACT. In parallel, like Josh said, this with my passion behind aviation. Um, and so it, it, special thanks to the Gilmont Foundation here. Uh, Tom and Marie and Bill and, of course, George for his huge vision with aviation and the impact that it could have on our community. Um, I, I have some more remarks, but um, when we heard of this um, coming through AACT and our site being selected, uh, we have a deep-rooted uh, culture of student-driven work. 
um, and our communication art program um, made a logo right away to support the marketing and vision of this program. And then our video production side of ComArts, who are here in the media section today documenting this historical moment, uh, they went to work right away on the first day of school to create a promotional video to support this new academy. And so without further ado, this is the student produced a promotional video from AACT that is out for marketing as we speak. Here at the Academy of Arts, Careers, and Technology, we have a wide variety of academies for students to learn valuable career-specific skills. For the upcoming 2025-2026 school year, we are excited to welcome the Aviation Academy to AACT. The first of its kind in Northern Nevada, students in the Aviation Academy will get valuable hands-on experience with aircraft structures and simulations, as well as an in-depth understanding of communication protocols, airport environments, certification processes, and more. Students will also learn important safety procedures, from fire safety to OSHA regulations, to ensure their safety in class and, eventually, in the field. In addition to technical skills, students will gain a comprehensive knowledge of the skills needed in order to understand and interpret aeronautical charts, as well as a thorough understanding of weight balance equations and advanced composite analysis. In the Aviation Academy, you will learn everything you need to know to get a head start in the industry. AACT is accepting 20... All right. And it goes into some details for the applicants that are coming in and to just highlight what Josh had said, um, we're looking at bringing in close to 60 new students into AACT High School as a result of this new program next year. And for the first time ever, we're bringing in uh, 10th and 11th graders to open this program with our freshmen for next year as well. So lots of exciting things. Ex Speaking of exciting things, our Kids not only do amazing videography and editing for videos, but they make a lot of cool swag. So from AACT to our trustees is our promotional bag for our academy to include a model airplane, um, coasters with our logo on it. Um, a shout out to my father for his help in uh, that piece. There's keychains in there as well. Um, there's a promo ad for the aviation program that we've been passing out to eighth graders. Um, as well as a couple of the stickers with the new logo. So uh, when we say we'll take something to new heights, you pick the right school. And pun intended, uh, AACT is proud to welcome the Aviation Academy with the generous, generous donation from the Miguel Mount Foundation. And I'll be available for questions. But without further ado, I turn it back over to Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And without further ado, uh, it's my direct pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Tom Hall. Tom has been engaged with our department in countless hours of meetings and planning and sharing the vision of the foundation and um, also a uh, privilege to serve with him on the board of Pathways to Aviation, which is a local nonprofit, which we'll also be collaborating with in this effort as well. So uh, when I tell you that he is a workhorse and an advocate for our community, he absolutely is. Uh, just taking a moment to read from, that's George W. Guillemot, um, the founder of this foundation ultimately who once said, as one begins to notice his golden age accelerating ever so fast, he cannot help but give more than a passing thought to just what kind of legacy he will leave for future generations. Since I have been an aircraft pilot for many years, it is only natural that I feel so strongly about the future of aeronautics and especially aerospace. Who will train these people? Where will the expanding aeronautical and aerospace production factories be located? Why not all of that right here in Northern Nevada? This is not a dream. It could happen soon, certainly not in the too distant future. Future. So with that, I will turn over the mic to Mr. Hall. Welcome, Mr. Hall. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, Beth, I've known you for a couple of years now, I'm talking about aviation every chance I get. Joe, nice to have you on the board. Uh, I hope we get you up in an airplane and uh, do a couple spins so uh, you get the idea. Uh, Adam, uh, He's been a stalwart supporter. He graduated from Amber Riddle University, has a pilot license, and he's been a cheerleader for us. So, um, in any event, uh, the story begins about 40 years ago, actually, this month, in 2000, or 1984, George invited me to his house to uh, provide some legal services, and I met George at that time, 
and um, I learned that George was a product of uh, public education. He graduated from Santa Monica High School. Uh, he went into the Navy. He uh, gra graduated from UCLA with a business, an engineering degree, and then he went back and put himself through an uh, MBA from a public uh, institution. And he was a lifelong learner. He was a aviator, he was an inventor, he was a compassionate gentleman, he was a philanthropist. And George surrounded himself with uh, wonderful people, uh, one of which is uh, his uh, wife, Marie Gallimont. If Marie could stand up. <laughs> Marie uh, grew up in Ely, uh, graduated White Pine High School, and are they the wild dogs, wild cats, what are they up there? Oh, bobcats, I'm sorry, how can I forget? Marie has been part of the family for a number of years and I met her as well. The other trustee is Bill Johnson. Bill graduated Reno High School, University of Nevada, Reno, and is a CPA. Bill, could you stand up? For myself, I graduated from Zephyr Cove Elementary School, class of two, and Wattell High School, class of 11, and University of Nevada, Reno, uh, when there were about 3,000 students there. I got my pilot's license a uh, year after graduating uh, from UNR, and I've enjoyed uh, flying. My dad was a flight instructor, my mom was a dance instructor. And uh, by the way, I was valedictorian of my eighth grade class of two. But um, in any event, I'm, uh, I'm uh, thoroughly convinced that our youth are the most important people in our lives. It's statistically proven that youth constitute about 33 and a third percent of our population, but they constitute 100 percent of our future. And if we don't take care of our youth in every way we can, we're missing something. So getting on with George, so it turned out I met him 40 years ago. 20 years ago, he asked me to go to John Lilly at the University of Nevada and present an idea for a, a school of aeronautics and astronautics. Uh, John Lilly turned out to be a great friend of mine over the years. Um, said he had to study it, so we had a committee. And that's what you do at college, you get a committee. And we studied it for a couple of years, a couple of months rather, and. The third meeting, John Lilly asked me how much money would George going to put up for this, and he said, uh, how about $40 million? I told John that, and we studied it for two years, and they turned us down. They said they don't have a program, they don't want a program, uh, they don't have students, they don't have professors, uh, they don't have champions. I didn't have champions, and it was not in their master plan. So when we turned down in February 2005, I thought, uh, what to do now? And I was invited then to attend a board meeting of the Reno Air Racing Foundation. And I did that and asked what uh, they had as committees, and they said education outreach. I said, put me on that. And so I invited all my pilot friends, and we met for a couple months. And uh, in January of 2006, I asked the board who was going to be the president, and they said, that's you, Tom. You're the only one that's doing something. So I became the president of the Reno Air Racing Foundation. I told George about it, and uh, George says, Tom, when you run into a brick wall, it hurts. So don't bother me about your stories about aviation education. I said, well, George, it's still a valid idea. It's still worthy, and I'll do it. The Air Racing Association, the foundation was kind of interesting because when we started doing programs into our high schools, they said, Tom, slow down. We only want one event a year to coincide with our air races. We don't want you doing things 12 months a year. We want you to do what's one thing. And I said, well, no, that won't work because education is a, a year-round project. And so uh, we said we need something else to as a banner, as a banner, and so a professor at the university and I were talking, we, we came up, we need a path. We need a path to aviation. We need a path to get kids interested in going into the aviation world. So we coined the phrase Pathways to Aviation, 
And so we renamed the Reno Air Racing Foundation Pathways to Aviation. And I've been president and board member for 20 years. And more recently, George uh, became ill, and Bill and Marie and I started thinking about the legacy of George, even though he personally didn't want to partake. Uh, it was in his uh, trust papers and his estate plan, so we started meeting, and I called up the Wasser County School District. I said, who would be a good person to talk to about aviation education? And they said, uh, Josh, my buddy. And so we started meeting over on Edison Way for about two years, almost every month with an agenda. Uh, we had a number of people. The university uh, had a professor, uh, Pietro Volgaris. We had Josh, I mean, Adam Mayberry came. We had an elementary school teacher, jo uh, Jana O'Coin. O'Coin, you might, might know her. Matter of fact, she take, took the lead in the J. Wood Raw Elementary School theme of education is, is aviation, and that's been delightful. And then uh, Adam Searchy showed up once, and uh, uh, other people from the Washoe County, and uh, your engineer, your people, your space managers, and everything. And it was not clear where we're going to end up, but uh, we kept pushing. When George passed on, we made a gift, we meaning the trustees, made a gift to UNR of $36 million for an aer aeronautics program at UNR. It was the largest cash gift ever made to University of Nevada, Reno. And they, uh, they've they expressed great gratitude, so we're in the process of a 10-year program. Part of the $36 million was to rehab the atmosphere and planetarium, and I don't know if any of you went to UNR. I did. They were building it when I was there, and that's a long, long time ago, 1963. But uh, part of our money is going to rehab the atmospherium into a light show with uh, LED lights. And uh, Brian Sandoval was so excited when we went to Salt Lake City and saw the sample. And a matter of fact, he wanted to move it to central uh, campus so all the campus people could see it. But uh, our plan was to have it at the atmosphere and planetarium so that the kids that are interested in space and aviation could see it. One thing I wanted to do was have all the kids in fifth and sixth grade in Washoe County to attend. So I said we needed, I understood, maybe it's true or not, but there's 62,000 students in Washoe County School District, so I figured 10% are fifth and sixth graders. So I said, well, that's 6,200, and there's six counties in our region. We have Washoe, Carson, Minden, Lyon, Story County, and Churchill. And I said, I want 10,000 tickets a year free. And the university said, no, we can't do that. Uh, that's not in our program. I said, well, guess what? We've got the checkbook, so make it your program. So now when they talk about this, they say, and by the way, we give 10,000 tickets to our fifth and sixth graders across our northern Nevada community. So it's actually a dream come true. Um, I wanted to basically end by thanking the board here, and Beth and Joe, in anticipation of meeting with you, uh, Adam. This is a dream come true. It's a dream that George had. He was a lifelong learner and inventor. He ended up with 300 patents, if you can believe it, in the telephone components. Of, but his dream became my dream. And uh, frankly, I'm getting a little bit choked up here thinking about it because we're here to help our youth. I have five kids, all of them have doctorate degrees, doctor, lawyer, veterinarian, and two PhDs. And I just think education is what we're all about. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm kind of running out of things to say. But thanks to Marie, thanks to Bill, thanks to George, thanks to my friend Josh. Thank you so much. Uh, these conversations have been going on for a while. We've been meeting for two years on this. Um, and there is someone, so the community sees us sitting here. Um, we only have authority and power as a unit and in, in board votes. Um, but sometimes the community also gets to see the individual advocacy that we bring. 
as people with our passions and with our experiences. And one member sitting up here um, at this dais has been leading the charge with this um, from a place of heart, from a place of passion, and a place of commitment. And so I know that today is also a dream come true and a dream realized for Vice President Adam Mayberry. So would you please give the first comments from this board? Thank you. I, I, uh, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to lose my man card, so I, I uh, appreciate you choking up earlier, Tom. But uh, it's, yeah, it's been a remarkable journey, and I'm just so grateful for Tom Hall and uh, Mrs. Gillamont back there, the podium's in the way, and uh, Mr. Johnson, thank you for, uh, for, you know, for providing the support. You know, when the space program, before I was even born, first got off, you know, they talked a lot about no buck, no buck Rogers, right? And so that's, that's what we need, that's what we need to make this happen, is, is funding. That's what makes this, this program happen. And so we're, we're grateful for that. And of course, I want to thank uh, Dr. Harsog and your entire team and the capital improvement team uh, and, and Principal Maddox. Thank you so much. So, so proud. I'm, I love the logo. And, uh, you know, for me personally, just real briefly, I, uh, I think for, for a lot of little boys and girls, uh, you know, aviation is something that's in their blood. They look up in the sky and they see airplanes and that's all they want to do. Uh, they get tired of looking up all the time. And I was one of those little boys. Um, and so I was blessed enough to, to be able to, to fly and, and kind of chart a path of aviation, but I was a little limited. I had meningitis when I was a little boy and I got stricken with a significant hearing loss. So, you know, uh, deaf pilots aren't very effective at what they do. <laughs> But um, so I, in, instead, I decided to serve on the school board. I don't know how that happened, but it's um, it's it's been an honor, and, and I want my colleagues to know that you know we didn't we didn't Tom and I didn't come together and say let's just start an aviation program. I mean, we did the work. You know, the district, the staff did the work. We did a study to see if there was a demand. There was a demand. You know, there was a lot of work that went in, in uh, behind the scenes. So I'm grateful for that. Um, Dr. Hartsaw, could you tell us just a little bit about maybe just at a high level some of the curriculum that this program may offer? I say that because there is a shortage of pilots. Just today, I, uh, there was a news report on a shortage of air traffic controllers, um, air, uh, aircraft mechanics. So no pun intended. I love aviation puns, but the sky truly is the limit for this program. So could you just highlight a little bit on, on what this curriculum could look like. Surely. Um, Josh Hartzog here for the record. So the intent is that it's going to be a four-year pathway hosted at AACT. The first two years will be focused on teaching students the essentials of the principles of flight, the physics of flight, uh, composite materials, control surfaces. I believe it's probably going to focus on both fixed and rotary wing aircraft, so teaching them the essentials of what it means to be a pilot. It also exposes them to a variety of careers in the aviation and aerospace industries, not just piloting, but uh, airport operations, air traffic control, aviation tech maintenance things of that nature. So a broad overview of careers. And then ultimately it's going to be um, pointing them in direction of what they need to be a pilot. So those first two years are the essentials of piloting and all the associated characteristics. There's also a heavy component on FAA regulations as well as air traffic yeah. control protocols. Yeah. The third year the intent is going to be to have them uh, learn what they need to know about drone aviation yeah. technology. Ultimately we want them to be able to be certified as FAA drone pilots, uh, which is essentially ground-based instruction. And then senior year, their fourth year, it's a bit in development, um, but the ultimate roadmap is we would like them to have all the instruction necessary to be able to complete ground school so they can okay. complete that, that ground-based certification. And then if from there they decide that they want to go to flight school and get in their practical hours, they can. That's a rather much more involved uh, process, as you well know, from a funding perspective. But that's the overall intent over those four years. So they could actually go to ground school, get their groundwork out of the way, and then flight school, uh, and that's obviously significant in terms of cost. But again, I mean, these are things that we could look at in the future flight training for our students. Correct, yeah. correct. All, all the while throughout that, exposing them to the variety of careers available both regionally and across the country. Great. And again, Mr. Hall, thank you so much for your passion. I'll never forget our initial meetings, and I'm, I'm so grateful to call you a friend. And thank you for all that you've done for our community. 
God bless you both. Thank you. Mr. Hall, Mrs. Gillamont, Mr. Johnson, Dr. Hartzog, Mr. Maddock, and uh, Vice President Mayberry, uh, on behalf of uh, Washoe County School District, just want to express our gratitude. This is a, a great example of the community partnerships that we just continue to develop and the ways that we expand educational opportunities for our students. Under Josh's leadership with CTE, we've really been able to expand uh, apprenticeships and uh, various dimensions of CTE programming. Earlier, we heard from Kendra and Troy regarding concurrent and dual credits. And this is just an example of Washoe County School District continuing to work to expand programming options for our students. And I think when we are looking at 100% of the future, the greater those programming options are, the, the better off we're all going to be. And so I just wanted to make sure that we express our very sincere gratitude and thank you on behalf of Washoe County School District. Okay. I was going to go to public comment, but oh, we could. Do you want to go please. next? Okay. Thank you. Th this is truly very exciting and visionary. and. My question is, so we have a, we'll have a four-year degree, yippee, and UNR is working also on aviation programming, so then there is a nice pathway uh, to continue with WSCSD and UNR. Josh Hartzog here again. Yes, correct. So we've been involved in talks with TMCC to see what available opportunities there are for students to be able to engage in post-secondary pathways with TMCC as well as UNR. UNR has been at the table from the get-go. And then also we've been working with the Desert Research Institute on the side of drones. So I feel like we have a fairly robust um, connection to our various post-secondary partners regionally. Thank you for that. That's extremely important. Okay, so TMCC is uh, part of our vertical alignment and integration. So we started elementary school, Jay Woodraw. We haven't yet focused on the middle school, but we have two high schools. We have Washoe County High School. We have uh, Bishop Minogue High School that are promoting aviation as a curriculum. Uh, UNR is more in the research um, and uh, uh, research area, but TMCC is more in the piloting of the tech school. And actually, it turns out kind of an oddity. I met a gentleman at the Eastern Kentucky University outside of Lexington, and EKU has a flight program that's integrated into their entire college. They have an entry class of 167 students in the pi uh, pilot training now. They have a class, a whole, a whole school of, se of 500 students. They just moved into a brand new building for their aviation program. They have a uh, airport next to um, Richmond, and it's very similar to the airport at uh, Reno Stead. And so Mr. James Glass is coming out and meeting with TMCC on October 4th for a day-long session on, as a consultant. And so we expect great things to come out of TMCC, and we're talking about building a hangar, funding up a curriculum, and doing things like that. So. I mentioned the thing about champions, and uh, Mr. Gilmont had a, a view that if he had put enough money out, that would bring people to it. Well, partly partly right, partly wrong, because you have to have the, the, the group of champions. And I consider everyone on this table, all of you guys now are champions. And so we're not going to let you forget that you're part of this, and even Neil, the attorney. <laughs> And so the champions are being multiplied as we speak right here. Wonderful. Um, I see Trustee Church's hand up, so I'm going to go to him, and then we're going to go to public comment, and this is an item for action. Just a quick, I had to put my Air Force hat on. So, yeah, what a wonderful program. We appreciate the donation and uh, the comments also about uh, it's not just pilots. It's the ground crew. It takes a lot of people to get that aircraft in the air as well as the new future of drones and the air traffic controllers. So it sounds like a wonderful program. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam President. I'd like to uh, ditto what um, uh, Trustee Church just said, because I myself, unfortunately, I allowed my A&P licensure to expire. <laughs> but I was a ground crew, 
aviation. I also worked in maintenance control on Harriers. I was in a, a VMA 513 squadron in the United States Marine Corps, um, and that was a great experience for me. And one of the things that I feel is very important is that kids that look like me don't normally get an opportunity to get into aviation, and I believe programs like this will, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. My dad had an AMP, and I'll share the ticket with you someday. His number is very, very senior, so. <laughs> JJ, do we have any public comment on this item? I have no cards for this item. All right, this is such a happy moment for our community, for our children, for their future, and all because of a dream, and all these champions. So. There is only one trustee I'm going to call on to make this motion, and his light is on. Thank you. Vice President Mayberry. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I move the Board of Trustees approves the grant application to the Gilliman Foundation for an aviation technologies program to take flight at the Academy of Arts, Careers, and Technology High School for $1,900,350. Second. All right, we have a motion by Vice President Mayberry. We have a second by Trustee Woodley. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion carries six to zero. Congratulations. <laughs> and we have a very big check to celebrate. All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and let some of our guests head out while we close item 3.02.
and move on now to item 3.03. .03. This is the presentation of a Washoe County School District proclamation honoring Constitution Day in the Washoe County School District. This is an item for presentation and discussion only. And we have with us today our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Troy Parks, um, and then also in the audience, having him up shortly uh, from Reno High School, the We the People teacher, Richard Clark. And I'm not going to tell you what the surprise is, but I will tell you we have a surprise. So Dr. Parks, take it away. Thank you, President Smith. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Ernst. As you recognize, uh, Troy Parks, Chief Academic Officer. It is my privilege to introduce our next presentation in honor of Constitution Day. As you are likely aware, we have many strengths in our Washoe County School District, and one of those strengths is We the People. We the People is a nationally recognized civics curriculum where our students develop deep understanding of our U.S. Constitution, and they can apply that in both historical and current national issues. This program culminates in an authentic performance assessment that models a congressional hearing. WCSD schools have a long history. Oh, did you move that, JJ? WCSD schools have a long history of participating and competing in We the People, and they consistently perform well at the state and national competitions. Therefore, I want to introduce to you Mr. Richard Clark to take over this presentation. Mr. Clark is the beloved We the People teacher at Reno High School. He has taught We the People since 2007 and has led the Husky team to eight state championships and 11 invitations to the national competition. Please come on up, Mr. Richard Clark. So Mr. Clark, I admit that I'm biased because I'm from Connecticut, so I am a Patriots fan, but I do recall calling you the Bill Belichick of We the People. You're not the first. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce uh, four of my alumni, and, and I think this is what makes this program phenomenal. Is it's, it's not the kids who are currently going into it. It's, it's They experience it after. So I have four from last year's class that finished eighth overall in the nation, so I'd like to have them stand in when I introduce them. First, she was in Unit 3, Brooklyn Minetti. From, from Unit 2, Taylor Moore. From Unit 5, Caleb Oster. And from eight, uh, Unit 6, Aiden Casey. <laughs> am I, what am I, I guess, what am I doing now? <laughs> um, I, 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 September 17th was Constitution Day, and it's something that, that in my class I celebrate because we have a national holiday. It's called Fourth of July, and we celebrate the Declaration of Independence and our, and our, um, our, our separation from Great Britain. But if it wasn't for the United States Constitution, July 4th would have no meaning because by the time we got to 1787, the United States was in ruin. The Articles of Confederation were failing very quickly, and Great Britain was sitting in the back waiting for us to fall apart so they could get back their territory. And it is the 55 men who met in Philadelphia on May 25th, 1787, the 38 who stayed all the way through the summer, and on September 17th gave it to the states that made 4th of July what it is because it is that document that we finally had a country that we could then grow from and, and learn, and, and that is the curriculum of We the People, and we try to bring that to our students, and we've had some great success with that. Um, not just, just not just my program, but just countywide, right? It's, I mean, Incline Reed, um, Galena, Damani Ranch, Hug, uh, North Valley's, all the schools that have had it or still have it have had a lot of success, so I am just, um, you know, in their footsteps for the other teachers who have done it just as, just as well as I have. And so the Constitution is the fabric of our nation, and you help ensure that the children of our community 
understand the Constitution, can speak to it, and then can go forward as citizens of our great nation, truly understanding it. That involves a considerable amount of work. Can you tell us a little bit about what goes into that? So the, the We the People program, as <clears throat> Dr. Park said, is, is a fifth middle school and then high school um, curriculum. And the idea was with the bicentennial of the Constitution to, to introduce more civics. Uh, we have, over the last 60 years, have moved away from civics education. We have moved towards government education, and there is a distinct difference. Knowing what our branches of government is, is is great, but knowing our responsibility with our branches of government, understanding what we're doing here, what this meeting is about, on a local level, is is what we should be teaching in our in our schools. Not necessarily that the president serves four years, but who are the people every day that inter inter interact and affect our lives. And so this program is this intersection between what our Constitution is, the government it created, and what our role is in it. And so um, the students at both the elementary, middle, and high school level are broken into different units. Those units take on a different aspect of the Constitution. And ultimately, they are creating a presentation very similar to this, where they are presenting in front of a, a legislative body, a congressional hearing, um, they have to present a four-minute testimony that they have, have diligently worked through, um, and, and the students can, can speak to that. Uh, and they don't know what question they're going to get. They have to present it as a group and then receive between six to ten minutes of cross-examination, and they as a team have to answer those questions without any notes and be able to um, answer those questions with evidence, historical knowledge, background, and do it as a team. And so it requires both both the academic rigor of, of a college class, but also the, 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 the teamwork of, of a sport. And so it's, it's, it's a unique opportunity to have both of those things in a classroom. And I have judged one of those events, and I will tell you the future is bright with those students. Um, so before I, I'm going to take the honor of reading the proclamation, but before I do, we're going to get to the surprise. Uh-oh. And so uh, we're very lucky in the state of Nevada. One of our federal senators is also passionate about the Constitution, uh, is known nationally for the number of const little mini constitutions that are passed out by her office. And we have Jessica Diss from uh, one of our senior senators, Catherine Cortez Masto's office, to read um, something from the senator's office in honor of you, Mr. Clark. So, oh. Do you want to come up and speak a little bit about the senator's commitment? Yes. Oh, it's on. Okay. Hi. Good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Jessica Diss. I'm the Northern Nevada Director for Senator Cortez Masto's office. And I am at, technically here uh, in, uh, in lieu of my colleague who's out of town. Um, and so uh, that's why I don't have prepared remarks. I apologize. But I do want to say as um, uh, as President Smith mentioned, Senator Cortez Masto is a huge supporter of civics education as an attorney, a former attorney general, and now um, the first uh, Latina senator in the United States Senate and first female senator from Nevada. She is a huge proponent of these programs. Um, in my personal capacity, as also a lawyer and a total civics nerd, I just want to say I wish this program had existed when I was in school. And as a Reno High graduate, I want to say, go Huskies. And um, uh, I just really want to thank the board for recognizing, recognizing Constitution Day and um, educators like Mr. Clark for um, promoting civics education and really um, instilling that passion in their students. So thank you. Thank you. We're so proud of you, Mr. Clark, and not at all surprised that your efforts and that of our students have also received national attention. So after I read this proclamation, we will also get up and we will take a photo. That seems to be the trend today to honor all of you. And so uh, with that, um, I will go ahead and read this proclamation on behalf of Superintendent Joe Ernst. Whereas September 17th, 2024 and the week following marks the 237th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution of the United States of America by the Constitutional Convention in 1787, and whereas each year Americans should use this time as an opportunity to reflect on the rights and responsibilities outlined in the world's oldest written constitution, which established six basic governing principles for society, popular civility, the rule of law, federalism, judicial review, 
individual rights, and separation of powers through a system of checks and balances. And whereas the Constitution, along with the Bill of Rights and other amendments, ensures the distribution of functions and responsibilities among three separate branches of government and a system of checks and balances to calibrate those powers, ultimately ensuring the protection of individual rights and liberties. And whereas teachers throughout the Washoe County School District, beginning in elementary school, strive to provide students with age-appropriate standards-based lessons on the U.S. Constitution, including through the use of the Center of Civic Education's We the People, the Citizen and Constitution Program, and whereas We the People teams from Washoe County School District High Schools have consistently moved forward to national competitions since the competition began in 1988, including the 2024 Reno High School team, which placed eighth in the national finals. Now, therefore, I, Joe Ernst, Superintendent of Washoe County School District, spoken now by Elizabeth Smith, President of the Board, do hereby proclaim September 17th as Constitution Day and further proclaim the week of September 17th through 23rd, 2024 as Constitution Week in the Washoe County School District. I urge all students, staff, and members of the community to reaffirm the ideals of the Constitution and look for opportunities to celebrate Constitution Day. Thank you. And now we'd love to get up and take a photo with you. All right, everyone. So that closes item 3.03, .03, and we move on now to 3.04, the presentation of a Washoe County School District proclamation honoring Hispanic Heritage Month in the Washoe County School District. This is an item for presentation and discussion only. And we saw her earlier today when she led us in the pledge. Our Director of Equity and Diversity, Lanisha Battle, is here to talk with us about this month and the wonderful students we have with us. Good afternoon, President Smith, Superintendent Ernst, our board, and all of us here today. In 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed a bill establishing Hispanic Heritage Week. 
This observation was initiated during a time when Hispanic and Latinx communities were becoming increasingly visible in American society, especially with the rise of uh, political and labor activists who championed civil rights for farm workers and underrepresented communities. In 1988, two decades after the creation of Hispanic Heritage Week, President Ronald Reagan expanded the celebration to cover a full month from September 15th to October 15th. The date of September 15th was chosen because it coincides with the Independence Day celebrations of several Latin American countries, including Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua all of which declared independence from Spain on September 15, 1821. Additionally, Mexico celebrates its independence on September 16th and Chile on September 18th. This period is therefore a time of great historical significance for many Hispanic and Latinx nations. In Washoe County School District, where we strive to embrace student diversity as one of our greatest strengths, it is especially meaningful to celebrate this month. Hispanic Heritage Month is a reminder of the cultures, traditions, and histories that have shaped the lives of many of our classmates, neighbors, and friends. Hispanic Heritage Month is a celebration of identity. For, more, for our more than 25,000 Hispanic, Hispanic and Latinx students and 1,400 employees, this month is an opportunity to reflect on their heritage and pride. It's a time to reconnect with the traditions of their ancestors, from the vibrant music and dance to the inspiring stories of resilience and triumph. In a world that often asks people to blend in, this month encourages us to all stand out, celebrating what makes us unique while finding strength in our shared values. It's a reminder of history. Hispanic and Latinx communities have contributed to every aspect of American life from politics to art to science to civil rights. Figures like Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez and Sonia Sotomayor have not only broken barriers but have paved paths for future generations. When we learn about these leaders, we see how diversity enriches and strengthens our nation. We recognize that the history of Hispanic and Latinx people is American history. American history. But this celebration is not just for one group. In a school system like WCSD, where the majority of students come from minority backgrounds, Hispanic Heritage Month teaches all of us about the beauty of multiculturalism, authenticity, and inclusivity. It reminds us that we don't have to choose between identities, we can embrace and celebrate all cultures and identities. At a time when the world often feels divided, celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month helps us understand the power of unity. We recognize that our stories may differ, and our, but our dreams and aspirations are shared. As a mi majority minority school system, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to model what inclusive, respectful communities can look like every day. As we celebrate the vibrancy of Hispanic and Latinx heritage, let's also think about the ways we can contribute to a more inclusive and supportive world where everyone's story matters and everyone's voice is heard. Thank you. We do have a few people here with us today. Behind me, we have our Hug High School Latino Club. Uh, we have two of our teachers here with us today, Robert Ramirez and Juan Hurtado. I'm awful. I admit it right now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we also have uh, two student speakers who will follow them, Andy Vizcara and Ileana Ramirez. Welcome. Hi, I'm Andy Vizcarra, and I'm the president of the Hug Latino Club. I'm super honored and thankful for t to be here for this very beautiful moment that we have been provided. And it is a very uh, good accomplishment that we have been here for a second time in a row. And during Hispanic Month, which is a very good accomplishment for our community. 
And our community is great to be here since we have been provided this moment to recognize our community, our Hispanic community. And with this being here in ACT, we are basically a change. We are here to show that anything is possible. We can start changes. And with the Hug Latino Club being in ACT at the Washoe County, we can involve other schools in the Washoe District to be involved, be proud of who they are, and be part of a club that needs to be recognized throughout the Washoe District. And I hope other schools throughout the Washoe District can be involved as Hug High School. And this shows that the other schools can be involved and be proud of who they are. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Desiree Salavaca, and I'm the Vice President of Latino Club. Welcome, Desiree. Hello. My name is Sofia Silva, and I'm the Secretary of the Hug Latino Club. Welcome, Sophia. Hello, my name is Emily Estrada, and I am the treasurer for Latino Club. Welcome, Emily. Same. Hi, my name is Ileana Ramirez, and I'm a senior at Hug High School, as well as the marketer for the Latino Club. I've been with the Latino Club for the past two years, and it has been an amazing opportunity to be able to experience it, especially when I see the Latino Club help students first-gen students in furthering their career for college by providing them the opportunities for volunteer hours needed for scholarships, as well as inspiring me, and it increases my awareness of what clubs like these really do mean for the community and their students and being able to help them achieve their goals. Some things that we're excited about partaking in would be the Hispanic Heritage event hosted at UNR in collaboration with UNR's Latino Club. But most importantly, we're excited to be able to partake in stuff that happens around our own schools. For example, with our annual street fair party that we do at the end of the school year, or even just hosting workshops and fundraisers around our campuses to engage in our community. Being able to participate and engage in our community is really important in our journey of spreading awareness of the Latino Club and spreading awareness of just being able to represent your culture within our district as well as creating that safe space for students of Hispanic, to, of Hispanic descent to represent themselves freely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliana. Thank you to our Hug High School Latino Club. We want to just take a moment to thank you for coming out and speaking uh, to our board today and just being representative of, of Hug High School. Do the teachers have anything before we move on? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Ramirez, and I am one of two of the advisors for the Latino Club. I just wanted to give a quick update. Uh, so last year we had the opportunity to come speak to y'all and we had six students come up here and give a, a little speech. Uh, so five of them were seniors. One of them was a junior who is now a senior. Um, and four out, of the, four out of the five went on and are in college now as a first gen. And our president from last year is joining the National Guard and then going to college right after. So just wanted to give out that update. That is wonderful news. Thank Congratulations to them, Robert. Yeah. I'd like to take just a moment to recognize some of our dignitaries, if you will, that are in the audience that came out to celebrate with us today. We have uh, Dr. Salido Sanchez and Bernardo Aguilar, members of the Nevada Latino Stakeholders Council. Uh, Shelby Baitez, um, UNR Outreach and Community Engagement, Michael Scherzer, Sparks Equity and Inclusion Advisory Board member, and Kevin Perez, Senior Director of Education at the Nevada Discovery Museum. Thank you so much for being here with us today and um, reaching out as part of our community and coming in for this celebration. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you for all of our guests for being here. And thank you so much, the students. You did an amazing job. You didn't even have any notes. It was, it was incredible. And I'm not at all surprised to hear about the success that our students from last year are also um, experiencing now. So we do have a proclamation that we will be reading. Um, and so we're very lucky as a board to have great diversity and representation um, on our board. Clerk Joe Rodriguez is not able to be with us today. Um, but we, of course, do have Trustee Alex Woodley 
And uh, before he reads the proclamation um, in both Spanish and English, with Spanish first, I wanted to give you the opportunity to speak for a bit. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um, I remember Liliana from last year, so it's nice to see you here again. Thank you very much. This is a great opportunity for us to have the ability to um, acknowledge and celebrate uh, what makes us different, even though we all have a lot in common as well. Um, I like seeing uh, two of my fellow Nevada Latino stakeholder uh, council members in the audience. Thank you very much. It's good to see you guys. Um, and I look forward to reading this. Uh, and just one last thing, uh, Mr. Ramirez, I'm going to start going to the gym because you're looking like you're getting a little bit too big. So we used to work out together. He was my gym partner, and uh, he's getting ahead of me. All right, with that being said, I'll start in Spanish first. Considerando que los Estados Unidos de América celebra el mes nacional de la herencia hispana cada año del 15 de septiembre al 15 de octubre para honrar las ricas historias, culturas y contribuciones de los hispanos americanos cuyos antepasados proceden de España, México, el Caribe, Centroamérica y Sudamérica. Y considerando que, que este periodo es importante porque coincide con los aniversarios de la independencia de varios países latinoamericanos, incluyendo Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras y Nicaragua, para el 15 de septiembre, y México el 16 de septiembre, de septiembre y Chile el 18 de septiembre. Y considerando que los hispanoamericanos han enriquecido nuestra sociedad con sus contribuciones a las artes, educación, política, ciencia, empresas y muchas otras áreas, fortaleciendo la estructura de nueva diver, diversa nación y considerando que la comunidad hispana ha jugado un papel esencial en el crecimiento y logros de nuestra nación, demostrando un compromiso a la familia, el trabajo duro, el servicio a otros, y considerando que el distrito escolar del condado de Washoe incluye a más de 25,000 estudiantes y más de 1,400 miembros de personal quienes se identifiquen como hispanos representando nuestro sistema escolar y que considerando que el distrito escolar del condado de Washoe se enorgullo, enorgullece en celebrar las ricas tradiciones culturales e historias de nuestros estudiantes, personal, familias y miembros de la comunidad hispanos, reconociendo que sus logros y contribuciones son parte integral del éxito de nuestras escuelas y la fortaleza de nuestra comunidad, y considerando que reconocemos la importancia de fomentar entornos inclusivos donde todos los estudiantes, incluyendo aquellos de herencia hispana, se sienten valorados, respetados y empoderados para alcanzar el éxito. Ahora, por tanto, se resuelve que yo, de parte de Joe Ernst, su superintendente del Distrito Escolar del Condado de Washoe, proclamo mes de la herencia hispana en el Distrito Escolar del Condado de Washoe del 15 de septiembre al 15 de octubre y aliento a todos los estudiantes, personal y miembros de la comunidad a tomar esta oportunidad para aprender, reconocer e involucrarse en actividades que honran y celebran la vibrante cultura y perdurables contribuciones de la comunidad hispana. Gracias. And now in English. <laughs> Whereas the United States of America celebrates National Hispanic Heritage Month each year from September 15th to October 15th to honor the rich histories, cultures, and contr contributions of Hispanic Americans whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, and South America, and whereas this period is significant as it coincides with the independence anniversaries of several Latin American countries, including Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua on September 15th, Mexico on September 16th, and Chile on September 18th. And whereas Hispanic Americans have enriched our society through their contributions to arts, education, politics, science, business, and many other fields, strengthening the fabric of our diverse nation, and whereas the Hispanic community has played a pivotal role in the growth and success of our nation, demonstrating a commitment to family, hard work, and service to others, and whereas the Washoe County School District includes more than 25,000 students and families and more than 1,400 
400 staff members who identify as Hispanic represented in our school community system, and whereas the Washoe County School District is proud to celebrate the rich cultural traditions and histories of our Hispanic students, staff, families, and community members, recognizing that their achievements and contributions are integral to the success of our school and the strength of our community, and whereas we acknowledge the importance of fostering inclusive environments where all students, including those of Hispanic heritage, feel valued, respected, and empowered to succeed. Now, therefore, I, on behalf of Joe Hearns, Superintendent of Washoe County School District, do hereby proclaim September 15th to October 15th, 2024, as Hispanic Heritage Month in the Washoe County School District and encourage all students, staff, and community members to take this opportunity to learn, appreciate, and engage in activities that honor and celebrate the vibrant cultures and lasting contribution of the Hispanic community. Thank you. And before we take our photo with all of our guests, I see Trustee Church has his hand up. Trustee Church. Thank you. Just a real quick comment. Cuatro y tres por ciento de nuestros estudiantes son Latino, y por eso es muy importante esta proclamación. Es muy importante. So I just commented that 43% uh, of our students here at Washoe County School District are Latino Hispanic. So it's very, very important that we recognize them in this proclamation. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, now will all of our guests join us for a photo?
All righty, everyone. We will, oh, we have one more. We're not done. Uh, so I will signal to our guests and to, into the board, we will move on now. We're gonna close item 3.04. We will continue on to item 3.05, our last uh, proclamation for the meeting, and then we will be taking a break after this one before we move on to the item after that. So on that note, we will now open item 3.05. This is the presentation of a Washoe County School District proclamation honoring Attendance Awareness Month in the Washoe County School District. This is an item for presentation and discussion only. And we have our Director of Intervention, uh, Rochelle Morello, here to start us off. Good afternoon, President Smith, Superintendent Ertz, and trustees. Uh, thank you for having me here, and happy National Attendance Awareness Month. And that's why I'm here. Um, today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the work and the um, amazing job that our schools have done to address chronic absenteeism. So during the years of the pandemic, districts across our nation experienced unprecedented rates of chronic absenteeism. We did it as well in Washoe County. Since then, our district has worked to reclaim instructional time through a comprehensive approach of professional development, climate work, development of staff toolkits, student voice, um, toolkits that have included uh, a variety of interventions, and most important, building relationships with students and families to ensure that their needs are being met and they have the resources that they need to return to our schools. Uh, today I'm gonna highlight two schools that saw significant decreases in chronic absenteeism last year. Um, first we're talking with, uh, or we're gonna talk about SWOPE Middle School under the leadership of present principal Mike Nakashima, um, current principal Ian Gilbert, and assistant principal Beth Martin, who is here today, do you wanna stand up? Um, they have done some amazing work at middle school um, to reduce the chronic absenteeism, and I'm gonna defer to she has anything she'd like to say about that. Hi, I'm Beth Martin. I'm one of the assistant principals at Swope Middle School. Um, we did work very hard last year and continue to work very hard um, this year to make sure that our chronic absenteeism rates lower. Some things that we have in place, um, we have an amazing team that works with us. I'll point out Evelyn and Vanessa who work to make sure that kids are getting to school. Students that are having a hard time getting to school, they communicate with parents, go to homes, pick them up, make sure that they have the resources that they need once they get to school. We also focus in, um, a lot on you know, strong customer service when students are coming to school. We have Emily Henderson and um, Michelle Oxborough who do a great job with welcoming students into our school every day. Um, we also make sure that students are connected with clubs. Um, we have seen the addition of sixth grade sports this year. So we just make sure to really build those relationships with students, make sure that they are connected to an adult that they can name once they are in our building, and just check in with them continually to make sure that we are meeting the needs of them and that they're successful in school. Thank you so much. Um, and I know firsthand about all that goes in at Swope Middle School to make sure that all the students feel seen and appreciated and welcome in the building. So thank you so much to all of you for what you do. Thank you, Beth. I'd also like to highlight the work um, of Jessica Wilson at Elmcrest, who also saw a significant decrease in chronic absenteeism. She took an intentional focus every single day to connect with her students, to welcome them, them back when they came. She built relationships with them. She did some climate work, and she worked together with our team too. So I wanted to acknowledge her work as well. And I would like to introduce a few key folks that actually work with those two schools in my department and have contributed to some of the success that the schools have seen. Um, so I'm gonna talk, uh, introduce attendance officer Trevor Hutton. And he's the attendance officer at Elmcrest. Reengagement specialist, uh, Vanessa Haramello. And attendance officer, Evelyn Mena at SWOPE. And Vanessa is at both schools, so she gets to experience all of it. And I'm gonna allow Trevor to speak a little bit about what it's like to be an attendance officer. Welcome, Trevor. Hi, thanks for uh, allowing us this time to come up and um, the recognition of the hard work that we do in our department. Um, so the biggest thing that we've seen uh, impact students the best is that approach that we have and a top-down leadership from connecting families to resources that they need, making sure that, like Ms. Uh, Maria said, every student's voice is heard, 
really, really incentivizing students being there every day. We understand that if we want test scores to improve, the biggest domino that needs to fall is getting kids into the building and being there ready to learn, ready to you know, attain as much knowledge as they can so they can be successful, be that best version of themselves. Um, one thing that Elmcrest does really well is they eliminate any barriers that families might have and they really look at case-by-case -case basis where students might be struggling and they let those parents be heard and know that it's not a defensive thing. It's, it's how can we help you guys? Um, I think everybody in this room got into helping kids for the right reason. They want to help them be that best version of themselves. And when families really understand that and believe that, then they can work together with school leadership to help them reach that best version of themselves. Um, so Elmcrest is a really good example of doing things the right way, prioritizing relationships, and then other things fall into place. And we've seen it with the results. Test scores are getting better there. Absenteeism really improved. So that's a, that's a great school to look at and see that it can be done. It's a hard job to do. But if we incentivize it and prioritize it, then we see results happening. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. And I do want to thank Superintendent Ernst for making chronic absenteeism one of his priorities. I do appreciate that. Uh, through a team's approach, both schools um, have prioritized increasing attendance through climate work that built student community and welcomed families into, the, into their schools. They met regularly together as a team with our intervention staff to determine a plan of action that met the school's needs as well as the individualized needs of students and families. They truly partner with their families. Through this all hands on deck team approach and partnering with families, both schools saw significant decreases in chronic absenteeism rates and I'd like to formally acknowledge the hard work that they did this last year and previous years in reducing their chronic absenteeism, reclaiming instructional time and welcoming their students back. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the, the trustee today that will be reading this proclamation on behalf of Superintendent Ernst is Trustee Westlake and before you read that, would you please give us a brief moment and speak from your heart on this topic? I know it's dear to you. Thank you, President Smith. So um, I am so honored to be able to read this proclamation. This is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I can't think of too many things that are sadder than a child missing out on getting educational time and advancing their knowledge, being part of a school community, and being productive and feeling, feeling worthy. And I am extremely proud of the district and our community for first realizing that there is an issue and a problem that needs to be addressed and for working hard to do this heavy lift. It's not insurmountable. We can do anything for our kids if we work together and put our mind to it. And I know, I know we can be there for all of our children in the district, all of the children in our community and the families and making everyone feel that they belong and that they're an important part of this community. And thank you to everyone that is addressing this and working hard on this. It's, it's, the value is, you can't even quantify what the value is, because these are, these are our children. Thank you. So I'll be reading the proclamation for our wonderful superintendent, Mr. Joe Ernst. Whereas, Good attendance is essential to student achievement and graduation and whereas promoting attendance requires noticing as soon as possible when students are starting to miss too much school in order to engage students and families and to identify and offer needed support and early intervention resources and whereas Taking a positive problem-solving approach to reducing absenteeism requires expanding data to include reviewing chronic absence and attendance data, availability of working contact information for families and positive relationships. And whereas improving attendance and reducing absenteeism takes schools, the school district, 
families, and community partners working together to identify and address factors contributing to students missing school, particularly a lack of access to resources, mental and physical health services, and access to basic economic supports, including food and housing. And whereas students are more likely to attend when these four conditions for learning, physical and emotional health and safety, a sense of belonging, connection and support, academic challenge and engagement, and adults and peers with social emotional competency are in place. Chronic absence alerts schools, community partners and families that one or more positive conditions for learning are not in place. And whereas reducing absenteeism requires taking a comprehensive approach that begins with prevention and early intervention and adopting trauma-informed approaches rather than responding with punitive action. Now, I, Colleen Westlake, for Superintendent Joe Ernst of the Washoe County School District do hereby proclaim September as Attendance Awareness Month in the Washoe County School District and urge our community partners to collaborate with the district on improving absenteeism in our schools. Thank you. Well done. All right, and now we'd like to have our guests come up for a photo, and this is the last one, I promise. Oh, and um, wait, before we do that, Trustee Church, I see your hands up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Quick comment. I want to applaud Swope Middle School. They, uh, they took their absenteeism rate from 30% down to 25%, big, big improvement. Uh, other, other schools, I hope they model them to keep it going and going and going, and yes, I support this proclamation to address absenteeism. And, for Superintendent Ernst, uh, here's me harp on it every time we meet. So I just want to make those comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trustee Church. All right, everyone. All right, everyone, that was wonderful. So that closes um, item 3.05, and we are going to go ahead and take a break. It's about 4.09 p.m., so we're going to take a break for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we will uh, re uh, re begin the rest of the meeting.
everyone. All right, first we're going to wait and make sure that we have Trustee Church with us before we re-begin the meeting. We do. All right, thank you so much, Trustee Church. All right, it's 4.35 p.m. on this Tuesday, September 24th, 2024. We're in a regular meeting of the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees, and we just closed item 3.05. And now we will open item 3.06. This is the presentation and discussion of Washoe County School District attendance data and the plan for improvement to include information pertaining to a community task force supporting district efforts to reclaim instructional time. This is an item for presentation and discussion only. And we have a wonderful lineup of guests for this item. Dr. Paul LaMarca, our Chief Student and Family Supports Officer. Dr. Mike Paul, our lead associate chief in the elementary space. Mr. Mike Kazmierski of Strengthening Our Community. And Katie Simon Holland, also of Strengthening Our Community. And of course, our revered former board president. Yes, it's very good to have you here. Yeah, I know. All right, and so on that note, we'll turn it over to you. And thank you so much for being here for this important topic. Thank you, President Smith, Superintendent Ernst, members of the board. For the record, Paul LaMarca, Chief Student Family Supports Officer. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and, and you introduced us, and, and I'm sure my colleagues will introduce themselves. Before I move on, though, I do want to acknowledge one person in the audience, and, and she just spoke with you during the last proclamation, and that's Rochelle Maria. She's our Director of our Intervention Department, and th that group does far more than just attendance work. But she's been a leader in this area for a long period of time. Um, she does amazing work, and so thank you, Rochelle, for everything you do. And I don't have a clicker. Oh, I do have a clicker. Okay, so we're going to move right through this as quickly as possible because I know we want to talk about the community work and we'll spend more time there. We, we do need to get grounded, and so we'll just go through a quick definition of what chronic absenteeism is. A student who misses 10% or more of instructional days is considered chronically absent. If they miss 20% or more of the instructional days, we classify them as severely chronically absent. Um, really, any missed day is an absence because you're missing out on instruction. Our state does allow for a couple of exemptions that don't count against chronic absenteeism. If a health worker writes a, a, a note for a student for a variety of reasons, that can be excused. And then up to five religious holidays uh, can be used to excuse absences. That's within our state law. Federal law does not allow that. So when we report out at a federal level, those are not considered exemptions or excused. Now, um, we were going to talk about why that is, and, and, and I certainly don't want to speak for the federal government. Um, but I do believe it, it's not that the heartless, it's that instruction matters. And whether or not I'm missing because of a doctor's appointment uh, or for whatever reason, I'm missing out on a learning opportunity. And that's what they're trying to get in front of. Uh, we don't want to overwhelm you with math. Let me make sure where I'm at. Uh, we don't want to overwhelm you with math, so we took out a couple of slides. But what I can tell you is that on average, based on last school year, students who weren't chronically absent missed about seven instructional days. Students who were chronically absent on average missed about 32 instructional days. That's a difference of 25 instructional days. That's a full month. It's more than a month of instruction. You guys, when you think back of your own learning, and this is when you are really engaged, every once in a while we have like aha moments. When you miss instruction, you miss the continuity, you don't have those aha moments. So this is why this matters, and this is why we call this reclaiming instructional time. Every child we move from chronically absent to non-chronically absent, we're reclaiming 20 to 25 instructional days. That's a lot of learning. That's changes in academic performance. So where are we at? Oops, went too fast. 
This is some information. Uh, these are uh, uh, chronic absenteeism rates based on the NSPF framework, and I say that because there are differences in systems. When we report at a federal level, the rates are a little bit worse than this. I think we're at 28 percent for 23-24. This is the rate that's used in our uh, framework that schools are judged upon. So what you see here is as a, a district as a whole, we did see a significant decline. It's two percentage points, but that's a significant decline. Uh, we saw that at elementary school as well, in middle school as well. High school, there was a slight decline, but it was relatively flat. So good news, we're making progress. Bad news is we're nowhere near where we need to be uh, when we look at pre-pandemic levels, which were frankly too high at that point in time. Um, this slide might appear confusing at first, but the reason why we wanted to share it is because Oftentimes, chronic absenteeism gets confused. So when you give a rate of 26% chronically absent, people suddenly think that th uh, one quarter of kids are missing every school day. Okay, that's not the case. So this is a snapshot that was taken from our big system as of last Monday. And as of last Monday, our chronic absenteeism rate district as a whole was 17%, and you can see it was 13%. I think that says 17 and 23 for middle school and high school, respectively. On the far right, what you see is average daily attendance. So on average, our kids are in school more than 95% of the time. Um, the worst day of the week is Fridays, which is probably understandable, that dips down to between 93 and 94% in terms of an average daily attendance rate. So we just don't want you to get confused on this, okay? All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Paul. Good afternoon, President oh, Smith, Superintendent Nurse, Board of Trustees. Yes. Thank you. And Dr. Purple, before you go, since we don't have uh, Trustee Church with us, Trustee Church, I just wanna make sure you don't have any questions up, up until this point so far. Um, I th I'll hold until the end. I, I kind of belong to dissertation, so I'll, I'll hold it to the end. No, no problem. Just because I can't see you, I wanted to make sure that you know that you're obviously very welcome. And if you have any questions along the way, just put your hand up, and then we'll make sure to get to those. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, all right, thank you. Um, I am Mike Paul, uh, Associate Chief for Elementary Education. I want to go in here for a couple of slides into some of the data and some of the numbers here on the progress we have been making over last year. Last year, And some of these numbers um, are definitely something to be proud of. We like to look at using that term increasing instructional time because as Dr. Lamarco said, it is pretty significant when we're looking at you know, when we're working with this issue of chronic absenteeism and bringing students back, the dramatic effects it has on putting students back in front of teachers and in classrooms and having that instructional time brought back to us. So as you see here with this slide, um, we have definitely made progress and definitely made great gains in bringing that instructional time back. You can see that Overall, we have a lot of our schools, the majority of our schools are making gains and increasing that time and fighting chronic absenteeism. One thing, one of the main pieces I wanna bring your attention to on here is like in elementary schools, 33, which is half of our elementary schools made 10% reduction in chronic absenteeism. So if we had a school that was 25% chronically absent, they're now at 15% or lower chronic absenteeism. So a significant gain, so half of our elementary schools. And as you can see going down the list, about half of our middle schools, eight of our middle schools reduced by 10% or more. And then about a third of our high schools also reduced by about 10% or more. So significant gains in a lot of areas in reducing chronic absenteeism and getting that instruction back. So um, something very proud to look at there. Additionally, looking at some more celebrations here, we can take a we can look at in some more numbers. When you look at the 2019 chronic absenteeism rate, that was our pre-pandemic rate. While we we have a tendency to look at well, what was happening before that time when we know things kind of fell off the rails in a lot of different areas in that in our pandemic, we still had a lot of work to do back then but we know it got significantly worse, so we're trying to see how we can come back to that, to, that, uh, to that time and improve from there. What's nice to see about these numbers here is 
we we are getting back to that pre-pandemic level and even in a lot of instances we're doing better so we are coming to that place where we are significantly like if we look at our elementary schools you know 40 percent of our or 40 out of 40 of our elementary schools are within 5% of those pre-pandemic levels, and even 16 of them are better than we were before then. So we are making that progress. We even have one of our high schools is doing a better job than that. And so we have middle schools that were, they are within 5% of that level. So we're making significant progress in that area that we need to go. So we are definitely on the right track. And like Dr. Lamarca said, we have a long ways to go, but we're headed in the right direction for sure. So one of the key aspects in working I'm with... I'm so sorry, yes, Dr. Paul. Of course. Uh, Trustee oh, Westlake. I guess I need to be looking for the red lights. No, no, I'm sorry. that's okay. You're fine. Yes, well, no, I'll, I'll wait until the associates call to them, and then, then I'll have Yes. Okay, there might be something else over here. Of course. Well, anytime. One of the key aspects we do have to take a look at is determining what are the root causes, what is the why that this is happening, and that is half the battle right there, if we can understand the why. And in really looking at this, talking with our families, talking with our teachers, our principals, our kids, um, there definitely are themes across our schools and across our students and families that we are seeing you know, basic needs within family units, within the community, whether it's employment instability, parents and families having to move around, housing instability, transportation within the family unit of not being able to get to school. Those are definitely things that we see happen across, across socioeconomic status all across, the, across our district. We have communities and schools, we have family partnerships, we have family resource centers that we are engaging our families in. We heard some things from our, our truancy officers that we, uh, um, just a few minutes ago with their working, they are doing a phenomenal job of listening to families and breaking down barriers and working with them. The, the thought of the punitive approach is, is completely out of our minds now, is what can we do for you to help you to bring you back into school? And that is the significant factor that we are finding that is helping our families come back in. Whether it's the, the mental health concerns that we're hearing about that are becoming more and more significant within our society and within our community, we're, we're very happy to know that we, we have mental health professionals embedded in all of our high schools now and we're increasing that more and more in our elementary schools and our middle schools. We're not where we want to be yet, but we're working in that direction. So that's a very nice resource that we have to provide there. And at the same time, while we know that there are these themes and, and of root causes that we're seeing as a system, there's always going to be those individual circumstances for every child that we have on what's happening there. And that's where it comes down to, what do you need family? What do you need child? That we can build those individual plans for those students to re-engage them back into school, where we always have to be talking and breaking down those barriers for every individual family. Our, speaking of transportation, our transportation department and our facilities department does an excellent job all the time of, of looking at what those barriers are and can we do something to provide transportation when we can to every, in every instance possible to do something for our children. We know our children in transition are some of our highest needs kids and our departments do an excellent job of working with those families to try to bring them back into school. So it's a community-wide effort and a district-wide effort for sure. Oh, just looking for lights to see if anybody had their light on. Um, so that is definitely something we are taking a look at. When, when we look here, um, an ex the, one of the first things that I heard um, SWOP Middle School talking about with Assistant Principal Martin, she said um, relationships, relationships, relationships. And that's what we heard loud and clear from when we were talking, when I was talking with the principal at um, Elmcrest and any school that is making progress, building re individual relationships with students and families is the number one aspect of bringing students back into school. And one of the main strategies that we are looking at this year that we are instituting across all schools is, is, is an aspect of being proactive. And in looking at our big system, our big database, we are pulling up last year's list of chronically absent students who are deemed chronically absent at the end of the year 
and giving the names of those students to our teachers this year and saying we're not waiting until we see who's going to be chronically absent or who might be chronically absent coming up. Teachers, here is your golden opportunity. Right now, you build a relationship with these students immediately from the first day of school. We're giving positive phone calls home, positive postcards home, welcoming families in, getting to know them right away. Yes, with every student in your class, but these are your these are your hot topic kids right now that you're going to love and bring them into your classroom and make sure that you have that connectedness with them before anything you know, goes down that road of chronic absenteeism and make sure that they are wanted and they know they're wanted in school so they want to be there. So that's, a, that's an, exa an example of a strategy that's being put in place across our district to make sure that we bring those kids in and they're always going to be with us. Um, I think that that is so, I want to pause on that because I love that we have learned, we're watching, and we're being proactive. That is so incredibly important that maybe not as a system we've ever been reactive, mm -hmm. but there was a waiting, and now we're getting out in front of it. Um, and I just think that that is really, really strong work, and I want to thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. So you'll see, thank you very much, on that second bullet, our multi-tiered systems of support. With that, another example I could bring forward, and I just saw it in action today when I was at a school doing an observation of an MTSS meeting, we call them. Traditionally, those are meetings where we, teachers and counselors and administrators, talk about individual students. And it's traditionally been about areas of academics where kids are struggling with math and reading and interventions and supports that they can put in place for academics. Now we are seeing intentional, equal focus on attendance because we know if they're not there, well, how can we intervene in math and reading and academic areas if they're not at school? And it was such a, a great example of what I observed this morning at a school where attendance was front and center almost more than the academics because the comment was made, well, students not here, we can't help with reading. And so that intentional focus now that has been the mind shift in so many of our schools on attendance is just amazing to see, so that was great. And like I had already made the example of intentional phone calls, is the entire school community is backing it. Teachers are leading the efforts. It's not the office's job to make phone calls home now, it's every single person in the school community is making that effort now. So it's, it's really great to see how much all of our schools are embracing the, the need and the desire. It's not just because I have to do it. They're wanting to do it and making sure that students are coming to school. So we're going to spend a few minutes now talking of, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry, Dr. Lamarca. I'm going to go to Trustee Wesley. Thank you, President Smith. Sorry, but if, if I don't ask the questions, I'm not going to retain it much longer. So. Um, Going back, I think, like three slides, um, is, have you guys seen a common thread with those schools that have done a drastic reduction? Is there a, a common thread working through those schools? And the reason I'm asking this, I think it's important as a trustee, at least I think it is, um, to, to know if there's things like when the budget comes around, things that I should be really advocating to support and bolster more if, if there's things that we can do more of that will give our schools more support and families more support. Is there a common thread in, in those schools? Yes. Yes, I do believe there is. And I think when Rochelle was talking, one of the very first things, I was taking some notes when she was talking. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, well, I, Assistant Principal Martin was saying the same thing. All of them basically were saying the same thing. And that is exactly what we are hearing is a, an intentional collective effort to build relationships across the school from all staff members in the school. And making sure there are trusted adults in the school that students can connect to, that they're not just um, you know, left to their own devices and hope the students come to school that there are resources provided to the families. We're not just working with the students, we're working with the families in a positive, proactive manner. When students are not coming to school, we don't say, okay, where were you? We need you at school, you better come, you better be here. It's the, 
welcome back. We're glad to see you. We, you know, we, we're, we missed you yesterday. We're so happy that you're here. We have this for you to do because we need you here. We're, we, you know, you need to be here. You know, your friends are so happy to see you. It's not a punitive approach. So it's more, the themes that we are seeing are more about the relationships, not necessarily about a program that can be bought and put in place. Okay. It's about the human connection that students feel when they're in school okay. is the most powerful thing that we're seeing. Okay. Um, and I think we've done some things that help with that, like the, the campus monitors, um, hiring more police officers that are there as a role model and someone else mm -hmm. that the kids can talk to yeah. and maybe bolstering our home visits, yeah. those kinds of things. And then our, our, the teachers are wonderful. I mean, any visit I've ever gone on, they are, you know, they're talking to the kids in the hallway and interacting. So I, I think we're on that route. Maybe we just keep going more. And then on the transportation, do you think uh, when we reduced the walk zone distance and provided more busing for the longer walk zones and reduced that walk zone, do you think that had an impact? Yes. Um, we are waiting on accountability for a final analysis on that, but I know Adam's team has been working with Dr. Davidson's team and they're looking at that. But I, uh, Laura spoke with me just a couple weeks back and it, it's looking very positive. It's not as, it's not as drastic as you might think, um, but there is some positive gains there. Okay. I'd like to build on what Mike was saying as well, Dr. Paul was saying based on your question. So what we did is we, we reached out to all the schools that made good gains. Um, and it wasn't just Elmcrest and Swope. There were several others. We recognized Galena at Academy, uh, Clayton, uh, North Valleys. There were a number of schools that made some really strong progress, as Dr. Paul talked about. And these themes and strategies came from them. So it didn't come from us. We didn't develop, well, we did develop the slide, yeah. but it came from them. And it was all about connections. It was all about the systems and the coordination of central office with school-based staff. And really the one that sticks with me, and, and I really thank Joe, Superintendent Ernst for this, is daily attention. Mm -hmm. This is hard work. It's got to be done every day. And I'll tell you, though, in the schools that we've seen that going on, there's also a ton of celebration every single day. So it's really fun, especially at the elementary level. The kids just love it. But So these themes came from the principals. Um, if I can, I don't, I don't, because I don't think we're going to show the video, but for those who attended the Evening of Pure Imagination um, with Education Alliance, we saw the video from the student from Innovations High School. And one of the things that she specifically called out uh, were some of the transportation challenges that she had at Innovations High School. And so I do anticipate this year, and, and I am very hopeful that with change for transportation, that those continue to build for the families that need it. So we're going to move into a, a section and we're going to talk about some of our uh, the things that we've done in the first 60 days of school. And we're not quite done with the first 60 days, so we're still in progress, but this is a snapshot. We're going to talk a little bit about capacity building. Dr. Paul's going to talk about a little bit more about some of the school actions that are taking place. And then we're going to have our community uh, guests talk about the community task force, those efforts. Then we're going to talk a little bit about evaluation and our goals, and then we'll be out of your hair. So in terms of capacity building, um, we are doing a lot of work. And, and when I say we, it's really Rochelle's team, it's, it's Doug Taylor, and it's a variety of folks that are providing support to schools. Uh, at every academy, and you know some of you were at the uh, August Academy, uh, big presence, big focus on chronic absenteeism, that work will continue throughout the year. Uh, we have had uh, invited all schools to several trainings. We've had 47 schools take advantage of some of our very technical taking attendance accurately type of training, uh, but also other uh, sorts of uh, capacity building efforts. Um, our department always has uh, a willingness to coach schools individually. We've had, I think, 30 schools at this point reach out for coaching in which our staff goes and sits with the school team and we talk about absenteeism and the plans that we can put in place. 
uh, to support students and families and staff in that regard. Um, we have had uh, full-on meetings with all of our counseling staff. Uh, we will be again with principals coming up shortly to talk about a very specific strategy, a bunch of strategies, but uh, some focus around check-in, check-out. So a lot uh, around just equipping our school teams with what they need in order to get this difficult job done. Oh, thank you. Um, Dr. Lamarca, can you explain, because I found this fascinating, I actually asked Superintendent Ernst in one of our one-on-one -on -one meetings, can you explain for the public and those listening in what the check-in and check-out is? Because I just find it, um, it's moving. It's, it's very moving, and I really want the public to know what check-in, check-out is. Sure. Thank I'll, you. I'll do my best, and Dr. Paul might want to chime in or, or Superintendent Ernst. So this is a strategy that's used across the board. It can be used for academics. It can be used for behavior, and it can be used for attendance. And really, the, the, the general principle is the student has an adult with whom they check in immediately when they get to school in the morning, and then there are different models. Sometimes they check in with every teacher throughout the day, and the teacher will take some notes for them on a, like a score sheet. Um, with attendance, it's really a check-in usually at the end of the day with that same trusted adult or even at the end of the week, depending on the student and their particular needs. But it's really an opportunity to make sure that the student is ready to learn in the morning. Um, that they know, as Dr. Paul said, that they're welcomed in, they're wanted, we want them to belong. Um, and then at the end of the day, it is to recheck again and how have you been, um, how was your day, what was hard, what was good, what were you excited about, are you going to be here tomorrow? So it's constant attention. Um, with attendance, there's some nuances, and I'm not going to get into that right now. We will be studying this, and I'll make a couple comments about that later. So uh, a few more comments about what we've been doing to start this school year for some strategies. Um, with our school performance plan, if you look through our school performance plans, goal three is actually titled connectedness. And I, I would be willing to bet it would be near impossible to look through any of our school performance plans and not find a goal or strategies related to um, attendance and absenteeism. Um, we have made very concerted and intentional efforts in working with all of our schools, all associate chiefs with, in all levels, and saying we must have goals around chronic absenteeism. And we have not had principals, um, you know, say, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. They're like, yes, we, we need to do that. And um, it's, it's just a natural part that goes into all of our school performance plans, and it's been great. Um, having the collective efficacy of all of our all of our school-based personnel come up with those, and speaking of well, oh, third is the collective efficacy piece that I want to talk about. But um, the Department Connections is our weekly newsletter, basically that comes out to our departments and all of our. It's like a bulletin from all of our departments with bits of information that goes to all of our principals and all of our department leaders. And on a regular basis, there are updates from our MTSS department dealing with absenteeism and strategies and things to help schools to connect and different ways to view to how to work with this. So that is a regular piece of information that goes to all of our school leaders and all of our departments on how to work with this. So that is always a great bit of information and training opportunities for all of our schools that is always going out from our MTSS department. And then as far as what we are working with with our principals, this has started on our training for our principals. You can see a picture of one of our days there. Um, Dr. Lamarca had mentioned that a lot of the strategies we talked about came from our schools. And this is an example of that. Starting in August with our academy, we had specific sessions that we all participated in of working with chronic absenteeism and how to reclaim instructional time and discussions around that. That continued into more professional learning sessions that we've had um, a couple of times throughout this school year that we've gotten all of our principals together of sharing strategies. What works for you? What does not work for you? 
a lot of those strategies have made it into school performance plans and what they're doing with their staff members. And it's a regular recurring theme in our professional learning with our principals. It's going to continue throughout the year as we evolve. You know, what continues to work, what does not work, let's strategize on how we're working through the year. And also in all of our one-on-one -on -one meetings, us, I mean, as a group of associate chiefs, we have our regular one-on-one -on -one meetings continuously throughout the school year. And every time that we go, it is built into our agendas that we check in on chronic absenteeism. Where are you at today? What is your percentage? Are you going up or down? What's happening? Um, what have you been doing over the course of this last week? What are you going to be doing next week? It's a very intentional, um, piece of our agendas that we talk about, that we work with. Uh, we make sure it's at the top of our agenda so we don't get mired in all of the business and everything that we <laughs> might get sidetracked on, so it's intentional that we focus on it. And principals have come to expect that and welcome those conversations to problem solve around that. So it's, and then we have the, and then the schools have their weekly discussions as well. So we are hitting it at a lot of different angles and a lot of different areas to make sure that it does not ever fall off the radar because we know how important that it is. And with that, it is time to turn it over to some of our strongest advocates we have, not just in our school system, but in our community. And it's an honor to have them with us for um, the leaders of Strengthening Our Community Task Force. We have a familiar face, I know, Katie Simon Holland, and then Mike Kazmierski as well. They're going to take over the presentation to let us know all the great things in our community around our issue that we are talking about today. So thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome, welcome, Mike, welcome, Katie. It's an honor to have both of you. This is incredible to have both of you with us. Uh, you're very much a part of the history of the Washoe County School District, and you have both collectively been a part of some of the greatest transformations in our community and our district with WC1 and the leadership of our district through many times, including the pandemic. So thank you so much for being here, and it is quite the power duo to have both of you with us. Should have worn a power tie. <laughs> Well, President Smith, Superintendent Ernst, uh, trustees, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm Mike Yasmerski, the, CE, the um, Executive Director of Strengthen Our Community. And um, I want to first have a special thanks to trustees Westlake and Church, who have be been beating this absenteeism drum for a while. I know it's been um, something the district's been working on. It's something that is uh, incredibly important, but I don't think the district has focused on it until our new superintendent stepped in the, in the breach and said, okay, this is a priority. And so it's been refreshing to see that, to see the change, to see things going on. I know Paul and, and Michelle and team have been working very hard in the trenches, but it's going to take every single member, not just of this district, but of this community, if we're going to fix this. And I truly believe it is a community uh, challenge. I want to just call your attention to this slide right here. Look at two years ago compared to this year. Do you see any of them lower? The answer is no. So while there's been a lot of amazing work going on, we got a long way to go. I would um, first start by saying, I believe, if you read the article I wrote, this is this is a true crisis. We're talking about, you know, 32 instructional days, but you put that in numbers, that's 14,000 kids just here in Washoe County. If you go down to Vegas, that's over 110,000. So what is our state gonna do when these 14,000 kids if they're not saved by these efforts, our collective efforts, end up eventually dropping out. I mean, when you miss 32 days of 180, you're not keeping up. And then you get promoted to the next grade and you're not keeping up. And at some point, data shows nationally, you get frustrated with the academics, you just drop out. So you end up at that two month point off our data charts and in our jails, homeless making babies that are now born in poverty that then we have to support with our, our, our social service systems. So the cost, if you, if you do this research, one dropout costs society $800,000.
and yet we can't find the resources as a community to adequately address this crisis. And I would challenge any of you to think back to when you went to school. Name one person that you knew in your entire education lifetime that was chronically absent. I mean, okay, yeah, there may have been some kid that had leukemia or this or that. that I get that. But we're, sh we're shouting from the rooftops at 23% versus the 1% or 2 or 3% when we grew up. So that's why I say it's a crisis. That's why our organization's 100% behind this. That's why our efforts are going to be to make this a community priority because when you start talking about cost, yeah, that's a lot of cost. You take the you double the number of dropouts in the next 10 years, just imagine doubling the impact on jails and doubling our homeless, and all of that will double as well. We can't afford that. Our, we can't afford that, but more importantly, and Trustee West, Westlake hit this really point hard, those are 14,000 lives that then create the cycle of poverty that could create many more thousands of lives that we all have to basically watch their lives be wasted. And it's just not okay, in my opinion. And so you'll see uh, our efforts are going to be to rally the community to support you because this is not the district problem, this is our problem. And that's why we're here today and that's, you know, it's been an honor to work with the team because the team gets it, the team's on board, but it's going to take more than the team to make this happen. It's going to take everyone to make this happen. So I'm going to touch on a few things. It's, um, you know, we're going to give a rollout of our, our plan um, in the next few days. You'll see a little bit more detail on that. So I'm not going to jump into all that. Um, I do. I do think it's um, it's pretty important that the community embraces this as a top priority. And again, uh, we're doing. You'll see uh, when we roll out all the things we're doing to make that happen. Um, I'm honored to be part of this task force. It's been ongoing for almost six months now. So we're talking about six months of work on this single top topic. Research, we have on strategy managing our sessions. We have the right people at the table, and we've developed a plan that we'll roll out here in the next um, couple of days. But this team is something that I think has been really a team of dynamos that are passionate about helping work this, and you can see the different organizations that are engaged. After a lot of work and a lot of research, there is no plan. If somebody thinks, okay, here is a silver bullet, just take this silver bullet and you solve this problem, there is no plan for this. And I've done all the research nationally, I've talked to Brookings, I've talked to all the other research organizations, and they'll tell you, well, here's, this might move the needle and this might move the needle. So we sat down and we developed a plan. And the plan identified 14 areas that we think will help move the needle. No one will fix it. But if you hit all 14 of them, you're probably going to move this number down pretty aggressively. And so we're excited by that. We, as a task force, said these are the seven that rise to the top that we can put the most emphasis on that we're going to get the community behind in support of the district. And, you know, I'm not going to go through them other than to say, our on-site coordinators nationally, and back to the words mentioned many, many times today, that trusted adult is critical. Now, sometimes that trusted adult is better if it's not a school district employee. Some of our families don't trust the school district, don't trust employees, don't trust truancy officers, don't trust social workers. So that's where we spend a lot of time with community and schools. Community and schools is a nonprofit that brings that connector into the school to augment and support the district as a resource to connect that child and that family to all the community resources that are there to help them. And so one of our priorities is to have um, a coordinator in every school. I mean, if we had an unlimited budget every school, but the task force said, okay, let's focus on middle schools. And we've actually gone since the first of the year where we had six of the 17 middle schools with engagement specialists or site coordinators, which are very similar, from six to 13 in six months. And that's thanks to Paul, thanks to the superintendent. There was some budgeting. The county provided funding. Community and schools changed some of the rules for us. A lot of work to get us from six 
to 13 engagement specialists or site coordinators in our middle school. So you can see that alone should help us with that trusted adult piece, um, a big part of what we're looking at. And, and we're not going to go through all of those, but when you read them, a lot of them just make sense. I mean, if the kid's hungry or if the kid is, you know, has no clothes or no shoes or no this or no that, they're not going to learn. So what is the community doing to help them? Because we can't expect the district to do it all. We have had some success already. I'm not, again, going through some of that. I talked already about the middle schools. We're really proud of that, and you know we expect to see success there. But we also ran a 400-spot campaign over the summer in Spanish on all the Spanish radio stations talking to the parents about the importance of education. And we asked our uh, Latino leadership across the region, um, um, both at the city, county, and, and university, representatives there, to message that from their perspective. And so we'll see, it'll be interesting when we hit the six month point, when we can compare an apple to an apple, if that moved the needle. But that's just one example of, okay, we need to really start engaging across the board, parents and leadership across the board. So that's just one, I'm not gonna go through the rest of those. Um, and then I would, I would just say, when we start looking at outcomes, we've set a goal of pre-pandemic in three years. But in my mind, that's a B solution. If we can't get our numbers down to single digit or better, we are failing our kids. And so my personal goal, I didn't tell the task force this yet, is to get to single digits in five years. And I think once we get back to pre-pandemic, that will be achievable. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Katie, who is an important part of our team, to make a few comments before we turn it back over to Paul. Thank you, Mike. President Smith, Superintendent Ernst, trustees, it's great to be here with you today. <laughs> and uh, it has been a great honor to be part of this effort. Um, I want to go back a couple of years, uh, and a philanthropist came to us and said, when I was still on the board, and said, if I was going to give a million dollars to the school district, what should we do with it? And so the school district pulled together a lot of leaders. Uh, Kristen was very good about bringing together a lot of folks and said, what should we do? And even then, and this was, you know, this was before pandemic became the, the explosion of crisis that it was, uh, they said, we're losing kids at middle school. They're becoming disengaged. They start to fall behind academically. They don't have enough to keep them engaged. And at that time, that was the beginning of, of realizing this incredible shift that has taken place, and I credit this school district and the team that you have in place for understanding the importance of changing from that punitive shift, that punitive paradigm that Dr. Paul talked about, to a positive reinforcement. Um, even the language, you know, truancy used to mean that it was the kid's fault. It was some kind of obstinate, you know, those were the bad kids that were truant. And what we now realize, it's it's 100% of the time there are system breakdowns, there are family breakdowns, there are breakdowns within the community that have caused that kid, that student, to say, I can't be there today, and I'm not going to be there tomorrow, and I'm not going to be there next week because I can't see hopefulness. And this district has taken on that job of creating hopefulness with kids and families again. And I just, I applaud you and I applaud the team. And I want to take a, a special minute to give a huge shout out to Mike Kazmierski. I mean, we all know him as the bulldog that he is. Uh, and he, of course, twisted my arm to become part of this. But, you know, he brought us WC1. He brought us uh, together around this chronic absenteeism issue. And and said, we are not going to rest until we take responsibility as a community to do something about it. And your team at the district said, thank you. And that always hasn't been the case either. You know, we always haven't been in the district able to say, yes, yes, we need your help. And, and how can you help us? How do you want to come in? And you're not saying we're bad and wrong. You're saying you want to help us. And uh, so Mike has really brought this entire effort together and, uh, and your team in the district, along with all of our other community partners, have been tremendous. Um, and I also want to thank Superintendent Ernst for shining a bright light on this. Um, as 
Mike Kazmierski said, you know, it takes leadership from the top. We can all be doing our little action and teachers can be calling parents at home at one elementary school and not at another. Um, but when everybody comes together around a single focus like this, amazing things can happen. So, so we're fortunate there. Um, we do need to uh, think about where this goes in the future. We are going to be continuing to work, and Mike has done amazing work on bringing resources uh, from outside the district to help. The district has come forward with more resources, um, but we can't continue to patch this together every year. You know, your staff, um, even with the engagement specialists that we've had through a very generous grant of $250,000 a year for a couple of years, um, those engagement specialists said, well, I don't know if I'm going to have a job next year, so I'm going to go get another job in the school district, and you can deal with, you know, replacing me. We've got to have sustainability of the staff effort. We've got to have sustainability of the theme of addressing chronic absenteeism, which you all have been doing a great job of, permeating it, embedding it in everybody's responsibility, because we are all accountable for this. But we've also got to make sure that funding goes out into the future. Um, there is a need for legislative work, and I know you're going to be talking about your legislative platform. Um, some of the things that uh, we'll be introducing as part of our plan are not on the school district's budget, but we're going to all have to advocate for uh, the legislature, the state, and others to step up. We know that um, philanthropists and donors are much more willing to step up if they know that the public sector is also making it a priority. And, you know, I know you all are aware, we've all learned uh, that budgets are where we express our values. Our budgets are values in action. And uh, I appreciated uh, Trustee Westlake's uh, comment about what do I need to be looking at. Um, I know your staff will be bringing forward proposals for you, and I, I hope that you will find this to be uh, a priority. We have very specific actions that they will be bringing you. Um, we don't want to do things that are um, one-offs. You know, we want to make this a part of the culture of the organization, and it will require uh, some investment um, by the district. And um, so, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that. But huge thank you to the district team uh, for the work that they've been doing, and huge thanks to our community partners. Um, and it is, you know, it always takes somebody that really has power in a room to get people into the room. We have consistent attendance from Washoe County Juvenile Services, Washoe County Human Services, uh, the Children's Cabinet, Doral Academy. Um, we have everybody in the room, communities and schools, everybody in the room, they come because they know how important this is, and they want to be there. They want to be part of this success. So thank you to everybody that's been working on it, and thank you to all of you and Superintendent Ernst for really making this elevated um, as the mission of our district this year because we need these kids back, and, and they need to know how much we care about them. Thank you. I, uh, I wanted to take a moment as well to, to say thank you to uh, strengthen our, our community, um, the work that we are all doing together to uh, address a significant concern that we have not only in education but beyond education and throughout our entire community. And while I think there is, there, there, there's plenty to be proud of as far as progress and um, steps in the right direction, we know that we have work to do. Uh, we know that this is not just a short-term something, that this is a long-term endeavor of which we need to keep our attention on. And I just wanted to take a moment to just thank you both. Uh, you, you, you've been gracious in, in the support and the work that uh, you're doing within our community, rallying resources, rallying partners. And uh, if we can continue to do that, continue to, to refine our strategies, the ways that we're going about uh, student by student system within systems levels as well, then we have some optimism. And I really feel like us all doing it together gives us that. 
And I also want to say thank you to Dr. Lamarca for his leadership on this. Uh, I know Rochelle is out there as well. Of course, want to say thank you. And then our associate chiefs. Our associate chiefs are prioritizing. As Dr. Paul said, uh, this is something that we are talking to schools about every visit that we have. And we are looking on a daily basis in terms of what kind of attendance that we're receiving, we're, we're having. So just wanted to say thank you very much. Thank you for your, your, your leadership. Uh, mobilizing the community, and then also just coming here today to, to share uh, the work that you're doing. And uh, Trustee Church, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, I guess that means it's my turn. I'll try to keep this under five minutes. Uh, number one, I want to quote uh, Mike Kamirsky and thank him for being here. Quote, the word crisis is not an exaggeration as the number of kids chronically absent in WCSD is shocking, end quote. Getting into my opinion, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart to be accurate, the bottom line is that baby steps are not gonna work. Bottom line is there's two main causes. Number one, board policy 5400, which allows unlimited absenteeism and the state rules on credit recovery, also known as restorative credit. Those two things, if we don't deal with those, we're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Please, please, please give me an action item, not a discussion item. Give me an action item on those. Let's deal with those. And, and I respectfully understand the other issues you brought up, but I think if we don't deal with those, we're not gonna uh, solve it. One thing we definitely agree on, parental involvement. We need to have the parents watching in the classroom encouraged to attend and watch their kid, what they're doing, whether they're absent, whether they're in the hallway, we need to encourage it rather than discourage it. And I want to bring up a, uh, uh, there's a song by Rod Stewart called Reason to Believe. Let's give these kids a reason to believe why they should go to school. I have advocated and harped on this, but we need field trips. We need to work with communities and schools or uh, the Alliance and other groups, Boys and Girls Club. And I mean real field trips. Some kids have never seen the ocean. Take them to a farm. Take them to military bases. I'm a little bit biased. Take them down to Corwin Ford and let them see what happens in the trades if you're successful. And if five kids are for anybody dedicated to seeing the world a little bit, spend a week or two at sea, see some foreign countries, no cell phone, uh, study, study, study. Uh, now, I want to bring up uh, a few issues. Um, in 2018, our chronic absenteeism, chronic absenteeism was 9.3%. In 2022, it was 25%. Then it went up to 31%. Now we're down to 28%. Oh, my goodness, this is going to take 30 years before we get down to even 15%. But yet we look at, like, the Coral Academy, charter school, their chronic absenteeism is 10%. So they're doing something right. And uh, Mr. Paul talked about some of the high schools going uh, down. Damani Ranch went up from 33 to 39%. That's the state figures that I use. We just talked about Swope Middle School. Oh my goodness, again. Yeah, we went from 30% to 25, but 30, 25% outrageous for a middle school, 25% at one of our best schools. Um, Wooster, yeah, we went down to 59% chronic, 59% chronic absenteeism at Wooster from 60. Well, 1% a year, how long is it going to take to get down to 25? We'll all be dead by then. So, again, baby steps are not the answer. Um, I'll bring up, you can counsel me all day to stop drinking Diet Dr. Pepper, and they paid me for this plug, but you got to take it away from me. you you got to have a carrot or a stick. You know, they said punitives are not in our mind. Well, maybe for some kids that just don't go to school because they don't want to, maybe that does have to be in our mind, that, that there is a carrot or a stick. Uh, we have to figure out what's right for each kid, and that stick may be the right right thing for the right kid. You know, we got massive ESSER dollars. We've got an increase from the governor and from the legislature, and yet we're doing baby steps. So. I think I've made my point. I appreciate 
everything Mike and Katie are doing. They, they know how I feel. We've communicated, Mike and I. But um, And I'll finish with one little comment. This is a year old from a teacher at one of the more at-risk high schools. Quote, I would like to make a note that at the time of the bell this morning, I had six of 34 in their seats. This is unfortunately the norm for seniors in my room. At the peak of the day, he or she had 16 of 33 in their seats. So uh, baby steps aren't going to work. We've got to deal with policy 5400. And I know I said it's going to wrap up, but I will, I will have a quote from policy uh, 5400. No student shall be retained at the elementary or middle school level due strictly to attendance. I think that's got to stop. Just try it. Make it a really low bar, 50%. Uh, if you don't go 50%, you don't graduate, period. Yeah, graduation rates will go down, but attendance will go up. Uh, and I think I kept it more or less within five minutes, but uh, I really appreciate uh, folks listening. Thank you. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, President Smith. Um, with all due respect to my colleague, uh, Trusty Church, I, I I get the frustration, um, I get I, the passion, but I'm gonna, I'll just say it right now, I am not going to be dead before this gets fixed. I know it in my heart. We have too many intelligent and more than intelligence people that have their heart in this. And I think we need to go back. That, they've only really been tackling this for six months. I mean, first you have to address the problem. And I mean, we all knew kids were being absent, but I, we were dealing with coming out of COVID and getting a strategic plan ready to know that we're spending the dollars in the right areas. Six months is, is nothing. I, I want to see what we're going to do in the next like Mr. Kazarinski, what we're going to do in the next five years, okay? I'm not going to be dead, and I think it's going to happen before five years, but we all have to work together. We all have to be thinking about what our next move is, just like in chess, okay? We might lose a few pawns here and there, but we've got to be keeping our, our eye on the prize, and we have to be thinking about our next move. The problem's been addressed. We've got a plan of action. We have community members and groups that are going to join with us. Our teachers are on board. Our administrators are on board. And now we're going to start pushing forward. And in my heart, I know we're going to do this. I know we're going to do this. And I just want to say thank you. And especially for shining the light on our middle schoolers. My heart is with our middle schoolers. I know that that is an age group that can be won or lost very easily. They have a lot of stressors on them, a lot of new pressures. Um, they're feeling the growing pains. And I know if we, if we shine the light like you're talking about doing on our middle schoolers, that's just going to make it better for high school. We just got to keep attacking and knowing what our next move is to make the next move even more productive. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you so much. 100% the extra work, the dedication from our staff. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, and thank you uh, to uh, uh, leaders, community leaders, Ms. Uh, uh, Simon Holland and Mr. Kismiski. You guys are amazing. You guys have a heart of gold, and we deeply, deeply appreciate how much you dedicate um, to this. I have a question because I have some thoughts that I'm in agreement a little bit with Trustee uh, Church and definitely with uh, Trustee Westlake, and I want to ask uh, specifically you two community leaders because you have um, a perspective, I think, similar to myself because I'm not from an education background. We're looking at this uh, shifting from a punitive paradigm. Um, as educators of the school district, this is not a question I would ask our staff, but this is something I would ask you because I agree with you, Mr. Kazimierski, we all have to be involved with this. 
And I'm sure you guys are familiar with like community court. And I know this is gonna sound a little drastic out here, but just hear me out, please. Because we're doing all this extra work and we're doing so many amazing things and great things. You guys are doing God's work. Thank you so much. But I just can't help but wonder, is it not possible if we talk to the, communi uh, the, the contacts that you have outside of the school district, I'm talking about legislators, I'm talking about the governor, et cetera, is it not feasible to, for them to look at something from the perspective of similar to community court, public nuisance type issues happen, they get community service, what have you. And my thought, my, my, the way my brain works is that I wonder, what if we created a situation where the parents of these kids that are at 10% chronic absenteeism or severely chronic absenteeism, if there was a, a, a way of making them responsible or having some consequence that if there is a 10%, 20%, what have you, that we have the ability to contact whatever entity that entity may be and that they could address through the parents. Because I'm gonna tell you, my grandmother raised me by herself and she did not pass elementary school. And just like you said, Ms. Kazminski, I knew that I could not miss school. And I didn't grow up in a nice home or nice, I was in the projects. And I knew that if I missed one day of school, there was gonna be hell to pay. So I just wanted to get your opinion from both of you. Is that something, if in fact we are gonna look at it as a community as a whole, is that not something that we could look at or ask our legislators to look at? Um, Katie and I may not always agree on things, so she will have her, her view. Um, I will tell you that after doing extensive research, the positive route is the one most likely to work for most students. And the data supports that. When the school district becomes an enforcer and a cop, we start losing kids. We lose, and they may physically be there, but their minds are not there. So you want to they, you want them to be there because they want to be there. And so that all those barriers have got to be removed first. Are there some kids that that isn't going to be enough? Certainly. And should there be maybe a track for those? Potentially. But my default position is do not be the enforcer. Do not go negative. Try every option first, and maybe that's your last resort. Katie? <clears throat> Thank you, Trustee Woodley. Uh, I grew up in the uh, in Oakland, and uh, we had uh, a lot of punitive uh, systems for uh, parents and kids that uh, did not show up regularly. And there becomes a sense of bitterness about that. Um, there are ways to do things um, that appear to be punitive that turn out to be relationship building. As an example, we were at Billinghurst uh, visiting the program at Billinghurst uh, several months ago, and there was a student in the principal's office working there all day because he had been uh, chronically absent or whatever the issue was. Um, but that allowed the principal to have time with that kid, and it was not being sent to the principal's office. It was, you're with the principal all day, man. You are sitting there and, you know, <laughs> and what happened was a very positive thing because that, that student learned that that principal was all in for him. So there are ways for us to use what might be perceived as punishments um, in a way that can be positive. Community service, absolutely a great idea. Um, I was part of an elementary school in Oakland that was actually a demonstration which you know we had no idea but it was a state of California model school we had we had a, a government in our sixth grade class the the class was organized as a government and we had a constitution which we wrote uh, we had um, you know rules for attendance and that sort of thing and and we actually had a court of the kids in the classroom that would uh, distribute certain justice for certain, uh, you know, violations of the, of the classroom order. Kids can take on those kinds of things, and those can be things that become a positive experience where we're not, we're not punishing kids. We're trying to understand what their issues are that are preventing them from being there. Um, but there are ways to make sure that, um, that the message gets through. Your job is to be here every day. 
And maybe there are ways that um, certain schools, and again, one of the things that we learned is uh, the schools choose different programming uh, strategies b based on what's good in their neighborhood and their community, what's going to work in that school. They've used different strategies, um, and they share those strategies with one another, but not every strategy works in every school. But those are things that, that schools might be able to develop in a positive way. Um, serving the, the school community, okay, you're going to come in and, you know, clean things up for a while, but you're going to do it as a team, and some positive student leaders are also there helping to clean up the school. So maybe there are some things that could be done, um, but I agree with Mike. The research shows that, that really making kids feel some sense of self-esteem, uh, and this was uh, research from long ago, if there's one thing and this was done with hundreds of thousands of students in a massive study that was done in the 1970s. There was one thing that you could do with kids that would lead to greater incomes later, uh, high school graduations, uh, educational achievement, health, uh, happy marriages. It was to build that child's self-esteem. And the more that we can build children's self-esteem one by one, uh, they're going to come back. They're going to come to school when they feel esteem about, self-esteem about being there. I don't disagree with uh, Trustee Church that, um, you know, we have, we have a lot of research about retaining kids or promoting kids. Um, you know, as Mike said, we're not, we're not doing them a favor if they have missed, you know, 30% of the school year and we're pa passing them on to the next grade. There is work that needs to be done about that. Um, and that's for, you know, people outside my pay grade. But uh, great comments, uh, Trustee Woodley, and thank you for those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 too, just want to chime in. I, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm glad that, um, uh, that Mr. Kaspersky and uh, Ms. Holland haven't actually retired. So thank you for, <laughs> thank you for staying. I know you're trying. But you know, don't, I, this is a conversation that's important to all seven of us. And, you know, we talk, uh, we have individual conversations with the superintendent about it. So it, regardless of if you hear from two or four, it's a, a priority for all of this, all of us on this board. Let me make that crystal clear. Um, and I appreciate the fact that, you know, a lot of uh, outside uh, individuals, community leaders, oftentimes get pushed away from uh, government organizations. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll fix this problem. I'm grateful that we're an ability to embrace your expertise and your support, because it, it truly takes a village. And Dr. Lamarca and Dr. Paul's efforts, um, you know, is, is absolutely vital. The, on the presentation, you haven't touched on the last slide yet. I don't know if there's a reason for that yet or not. It, are, you, are, are we getting there? Okay. So, uh, because I, I, that's my question is ultimately, what's the goal? You know, and and, and that last slide um, just depicts that, and I'll. I'll heed to the right time on that. That's I'm, I'm interested in if that's attainable and how, how we'll achieve that. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I really only have one comment, and that is I'm very excited about this. There's a collective optimism that our community needs from top to bottom, from right to left, and I believe this, this is a worthy goal and worthy work. Um, I love the concept of the adult the relationship building adult to adult, adult to student, student to student, community member to community member. I have many questions and many thoughts, but I'm going to leave it there because I look forward to the plan. And thank you for your work on this. Thank you. And we'll just take a couple more minutes and then there's obviously more opportunity for questions. So. Uh, and, and Mr. Kazmierski began to touch on this. Really what we want to leave you with with this particular slide is we're not going to wait till the end of the year to open up a package to see if we got there or not. We've got a plan. It is a robust plan. Um, and we are going to be checking it daily, weekly, biweekly. Uh, we will be looking at our gross outcomes for sure. Chronic absenteeism, did it decrease? Uh, we talked about capacity building. We are going to be measuring whether or not our educators feel as if they're growing in terms of their skill sets. 
uh, uh, Dr. Paul talked about systems, MTSS. We will be making sure our schools have robust systems in place to do this work. We've got a couple of very focused evaluations. One of them is around our middle school engagement project, and, and um, Katie Simon Holland talked about that coming from a donor. That's an important program for us. We need to do some evaluation there. We have a special evaluation of check and check out with West Ed. And as we, you, uh, proclaimed earlier, we got amazing staff out in the field. We need to uh, measure their effectiveness. Our attendance officers, our re-engagement specialists, our family graduation uh, uh, advocates, our, our specialists within the buildings, are they getting the job done? And, and if not, what do we do to better support them? Because uh, they will if we give them the right support. So we have a strong evaluation plan in front of us. In terms of where we uh, want to be, and I don't, uh, you know, Mr. Kazmierski, I've heard him described as a bulldog now a couple of times. I think he's a puppy dog. <laughs> now, I'll tell you, the first time he walked into my office, I was like, holy cow, this is a whirlwind. But you know what? Everything he said completely matched with our priorities. So thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for everything you're doing. And we talked the very first time we met about is it reasonable to reduce it by 4% in one year? And the answer is yes. Will we get there? I don't really know for sure, but we're gonna we're gonna kick every stone in order to get there. And I'd rather shoot high and miss than aim low and go, wow, we should have done more. And if we can do this and we can build momentum and we can do that for three years, four years, we will hit the, the targets that he's talking about. And that is getting to pre-pandemic levels or single digits within three to four per years of time. Um, it's not going to be easy, and it's going to require a dedication of resources, community resources and district resources. And, and then the, I'll just tell you again, we're going to be looking throughout the year. We're not waiting for the year's end. And, and so with that, um, if you have any other questions, I'm sure any of us would like to take those, and, and Rochelle Murillo is here as well. So, I think this... This is a conversation that absolutely needed to happen, and I appreciate that we are doing this eyes wide open and acknowledging the challenges that we're having, not just now because there's obviously been quite a bit of work, um, and there's so much that's been said that I agree with, um, particularly in the elementary space. I mean, there's many things we can do, but we can't necessarily get every seven-year-old out of bed in the morning and get them to school. It's how you build those relationships with the parents and make sure that we're understanding what the families are going through and how we can support them because we cannot be in all places at all times, um, even though we are tasked with educating our children and doing this work. And so I really appreciate everything. There is an important voice that we haven't heard from, and that is Calvin. So, Kevin, I know I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're in our schools. No one knows this more intimately than you do. And so I would love to invite you into this conversation. Um, all right. So I basic, So this is what I think. Um, I think the teachers really need to build the connection with the students because if I don't – if personally, if I don't like a teacher and it's not going to motivate me to go to that class because if that – teacher isn't interactive with the students or like they don't do hands-on learning they just give you like a note packet uh, students are just not going to go to class because they won't have that connection and I feel like instead of having students try to build connections with um, resource workers I think they need to build more connections with the teachers that are teaching them thank you and something that we've talked about as a board um, and that will also be brought um, in future meetings is our commitment to all the different ways that our children engage with us. And, of course, academics because our students are students. But we have athletics. We have after-school clubs. We have all the different ways that we connect with our kids after school and engage them and make them want to be in a place that shows them care and love and commitment to their development. And I know that that's something we've been focusing on with our budget as an expression of our values, and even more so coming soon. Um, before we wrap up the item, um, Vice President Mayberry, I know that you said you had a couple other comments or not. Okay, no. 
then, then I'm going to say thank you so much. Thank you. This was an amazing conversation, and I'm proud to have had it with all of you. So thank you. All right, that closes item 3.06, and we move on now to item 3.07. This is the presentation, discussion, and possible action to adopt the Washoe County School District legislative platform for the 2025 Nevada legislative session and 2025 to 2026 biennium, including language that clarifies the district's support for a locally controlled education system, continue and extend certain sources of educational funding, and other topics relevant to public education. This is an item for possible action and we have before us from Pinion Public Affairs, Dylan Shaver. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and thank you for staying late to hear from me. Uh, most people don't do that. Uh, we'll see briefly. Uh, this is maybe the fourth time in my career where I've followed Mike Kazmierski, and I apologize in advance. Uh, <laughs> As we go. Okay, I'm set. Uh, first and foremost, uh, on behalf of my neighbors and uh, the community where my family lives, I wanted to thank everybody here uh, for uh, the part you played in responding to the, uh, to the Davis fire. Uh, you kept a lot of kids safe, uh, kept a lot of folks off the roads so that people could do their jobs. We were near the affected area. Uh, and I would be remiss not to point out that the first time I met Trustee Mayberry was uh, during a, a similarly challenging time for our community that was the coronavirus. Uh, and his work as a PIO was important there. And I got to see him in action then, and we got to see him in action again. Uh, so thank you, Trustee Mayberry. Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, that's my presentation. Any? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we are. I am here today to discuss with you the uh, potentially the last staff in your charter approval process. Uh, previously, I gave you a lot of background. Uh, you just had that two weeks ago, so I prepared something just a little more streamlined. Uh, this document has taken many forms over the last six or so years. Uh, this latest version uh, is tightened up a lot. It is uh, con contains the values that are important to you, and it helps us tell the Washoe County School District story. Like any document like this one, uh, we want to make sure that we are not just telling that story, but telling it in a way that aligns with WCSD's values and the priorities that you uh, bring to the table every, uh, every meeting you have, every interaction you have uh, in, in doing the good work this organization does. So when looking at that story, we ask the question, what are we doing? What is WCSD doing? at the legislature in 2025? Why are we there? And the answer to that question is actually in the four planks of your platform. You are there to support our local community and in empower our personnel while we create space for students to thrive, which by necessity we advocate for smart and strategic funding. In one sentence, that's the pitch. That's what we're doing in Carson City. Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. Uh, that is what what our expertise is there to, to, to help them accomplish. We presented the document to you just two weeks ago, and we did get some uh, uh, very solid feedback around a number of topics, uh, one of which was uh, the addition of local control of trustee compensation. Uh, that has been incorporated in the way, just as we discussed at that meeting, uh, and as, it now asks the legislature to trust local communities to elect their own school trustees, determine their compensation, and hold them accountable for the decisions they make. Uh, that is the core premise of, of why we elect each and every one of you. We wanted to put it in there to, to reflect the feedback you gave us uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. There was an open question of school police and, and their jurisdiction. Uh, speaking with Chief Moore and some other members of the team, what we did is we added language just to, to reinforce what we're there to do is make sure school police, like anybody else on the WCSD team, have the tools 
in their tool belt to do the jobs they're there to do. So we updated the, the platform accordingly. Uh, there were some thoughts brought up around the topic of compensation as it appeared in the platform, uh, and a trustee made a, a really excellent point that, you know, compensation is just part of the gig, uh, and there's a broader, uh, a broader scope of things that make uh, coming to work here uh, a really excellent opportunity for somebody. So we adjusted that language to reflect we're talking about wage and non-wage compensation as well as the other uh, factors in the community and, and uh, in the workplace that make those jobs desirable. Those were the easy ones. <laughs> uh, uh, as we get into this uh, part, there was also some feedback regarding the charter school language that appears, um, and I just wanted to make clear from the outset that in every conversation we've had about this, this platform uh, and about this topic, at least since I've been here, it's been clear where this board stands. The Washoe County School District sponsors 11 of these 17 charter schools in this community. Uh, and it is clear that it is important to you that it is an important, that, that this is a part of the puzzle. We're all sharing the same goal. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it was also clear that uh, the, the trustees were, had some concerns about the protection of the taxpayer resources that goes into those, uh, because we know that they don't all have uh, Mark Mathers brilliantly, you know, managing every account and every <laughs> and every book in the state. And we saw that just uh, this year, where we we have you know charter schools that have not been paying their their PERS, for example, for their their personnel as they are required to do. So uh, we did get a lot of feedback on that. And so we came up with this language uh, that uh, is really rooted in protecting those resources uh, that uh, you manage on behalf of the taxpayers in this community in a similar manner. Uh, it also includes in it a call to sort of return to the 1997 vision of the charter schools in the first place. And I'll remind everybody that when this state authorized charter schools, uh, it was contained right there in the preamble to the law, that one of the reasons the state would do this is to, we would relax the rules in certain areas to create space for innovation, whereby the traditional public schools could then take the best practices and learn. Over the years, that language has been eliminated from NRS, and now, you know, charter schools operate sort of in their own regulatory space and structure to the point where they almost would seek to discourage public schools from sort of looking at that and, and, and uh, taking away some lessons to be learned. So the, the piece of uh, the sort of end, end piece here, opportunities that may arise from charter schools be available to all students, that's what we're trying to get at there that if there is something that is working on the sort of other side of, of, of this team, that we be able to look at it and say, uh, uh, you know what, we should be able to do this as well. Uh, and if those things aren't working, well then that's a different conversation, right? Because you know the, the question becomes what opportunities are being created for students if these things truly are not actually yielding the results we're looking for. So uh, th there was nevertheless uh, some concern expressed uh, uh, by Trustee Church, and I wanted to get into a little bit of what we do uh, with the feedback we get from the dais, no matter who is giving it to us. We do go back, we look at our language, uh, we try and see if there's a way for us to sort of address, uh, address the concerns without uh, uh, toppling the, the, the product as a whole. Uh, and realistically, the... Uh, Based on what we've heard from staff, what we've heard from you, there wasn't really a way to kind of change this uh, uh, beyond where it's at right now, frankly, because you're not asking for that much. Uh, at its core, you're, you're, what you're looking for is a consistent set of rules, standards, and oversight. Uh, there is also a sentence in here that I don't want to gloss over that does call for the discontinuation of for-profit educational management operators. Uh, that language uh, is, you know, bound to ruffle some feathers. However, uh, just as uh, Mr. Woodley in his other career would likely not support a 
private business licensing force that went out into the community to do his job for him. Uh, 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 it, 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 comes down to the use of those taxpayer resources to accomplish the educational mission at hand. Uh, and it's very clear from this board uh, in the way you administer this district with one of the leanest administrative overheads, not just in the state, but in the country is my understanding. Uh, that it is clear that what you want is to make sure that every dollar that possibly can be in the classroom be there. So uh, with that in mind, I, I'm very sorry, President Smith, that we could not find a way to kind of address this language, but primarily it really comes to, down to a point where you're not asking for something extravagant here, and it was difficult for us to, to pare back from there. Uh, you have options before you today. Uh, we are ahead of schedule from where we were in 2024. We are behind schedule uh, from where we sort of initially intended for you to be right now. Uh, uh, you have the option to approve this as it is presented to you and, and as it appears in the staff report. Uh, you have the option to approve with the additional <coughs> removal of a concept. Uh, you uh, may send us back for additional instructions. I would not recommend the last option, but uh, far be it for me to tell you how, how to approach this work. We will put in all of the time required to, to get it right for you. Uh, we uh, have elections coming up. We'd like to begin to introduce these new candidates to the district using this really as the, the cornerstone for, for those introductions. Uh, so uh, we are sort of waiting on, on you for that. But there again, it is your platform. We come about it collaboratively, and if it requires more time uh, in the well, we will take that time. After that, We've got elections in November. We've got a legislative session in 2025, in, in case nobody noticed. <laughs> and uh, we will use this as the cornerstone for which we engage with any of uh, uh, any of our legislative partners. Again, using the same philosophy we have since since you uh, uh, started working with, with me and the Pinion team, which is. We are here as an ally to help the legislature to make sound policy as it relates to public education. We give them the resources that we have at our disposal to help them make informed decisions. And uh, we, we advocate vociferously for uh, the kids in our classrooms and the, our staff and the, the families we serve. So with that, I will yield any questions you may have. Well, thank you so much. You know, this has been, I think, the fifth time we've talked about these topics since June. And we've taken a very deliberate approach. Um, Trustee Church, I definitely see your hand. I am gonna go to you first, but just for everybody following along, um, this did not just arrive here. We started this many months ago in the late spring. We've been talking about it in multiple layers. We've been gathering feedback all along the way. So personally, I think that this reflects all of those conversations that we've had. Um, and I appreciate the very deliberate approach that we took to the platform this time. Um, and I think that there's been some really good solid work here. Um, so on that note, I will go to uh, Trustee Church first. And as a reminder, this is an action item, so we will have public comment during it. Trustee Church. Thank you very much. Yes, Dylan, a, a, a tough act to follow. You're late in the day, so um, you, you've, got a, you've got a tough row there, uh, even though I do appreciate your humor. Uh, first of all, I, I could not disagree more with the comment that we're not asking for much. First of all, it ain't me. Uh, I've been opposed to this for a long time. I'm a supporter of charter schools. As I will explain, this will kill charter schools. This is not, this is asking for everything. As I'll explain, this is gonna kill charter schools statewide, not at Washington County School District. My first comment, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Ace, ace charter school. 8.5 absenteeism versus Washoe County School District High School, 39%. Over 95% of their kids graduate versus 81% at Washoe County School District. Oral Academy, 10% absenteeism. Almost all of their kids are college ready, uh, graduate, and their ELA proficiency, for example, is 70% versus 43% at uh, Washoe County School District. Math, Coral Academy High School, 
versus 24. So we, we're going to make them follow our rules. Now let's put uh, student success first. Nobody has to go to charter school. If you don't want to, you don't go. One size does not fit all. And these schools are perfect for certain kids. They love them, they excel. Now I mentioned that this would kill charter schools. It would. What you're saying here is they have to follow the same set of rules. That's the opposite intent of why charter schools were developed. What if they want to have less hours but more days? What if they want to go to school, you know, 300 days out of the year? What if they want to change the class size? Teacher compensation is an issue for the charter school. Are we going to require they be unionized or association just like the others? What about the challenged kids? And I'm talking, for example, kids that are severely neurologically challenged. And you're going to force a, a small mom and pop charter school to accept a kid that obviously they just cannot accommodate in any reasonable matter. But that's what it says there, that they have to take all students. And we've got to put what works and innovation in front of funding for our schools. I've done a lot of research. I did a lot today. Bill Clinton was actually one of the big proponents, proponents of charter schools. And I've got a lot of research on that. But yeah, this is not a baby step. I could not disagree, Dylan Moore. I understand I'll probably be the, the five to one vote today. Um, I think we're missing Mr. Rodriguez, but I think I'll be the five to one no vote, but I'm an absolute no vote. Uh, we are. You said we're not asking for much. We're asking for the moon. We're asking to absolutely, in my opinion, kill charters if we're going to force them to follow all of our rules. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Okay, so uh, first off, um, I just want to state, similar to what our president stated, um, we've been talking about this for months, and I'm talking about the overall platform first. Um, Mr. Shave, I appreciate how you have listened to us at each meeting that we've had and we've shared our points of view with you and our thoughts and you've always come back and implemented exactly what we asked for. Um, I also see, uh, fortunately for me, I have some experience with dealing with the legislature as well, obviously not to the level that you do, but I do see how um, you put things in writing because you do have to put them in, a, in such a fashion that it applies to everyone. You can't just make it specific just for us or for any specific entity. So I say that because um, what you wrote here with regards to the charter schools is you can't get more level, equal level, providing parity for all. Typically in government funds, government, any government entity, any government funding that exists, government cannot gift any advantage to any entity over another. All entities must be at the same level playing field in order for you to use taxpayer dollars for said entities. So what you have in here is consistent with what's the practice in every government, in every state, in every uh, uh, county. So thank you for that. But once again, most importantly, I just want to express my appreciation for the work done and how you've been listening to us and what we've been asking for. Thank you. And as far as I'm concerned, I would be more than happy to approve as presented. Thank you, President Smith. Hi, Dylan. I missed the bow tie. Next time. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask, and it might be just understood that it's in one of these topics, but I thought that we were going to have something about streamlining uh, licensure licensing of teachers or, or some weren't we talking about something like that where um, I don't want I don't want to say easier but less hoops and red tape and all of that weren't we talking about something like that is that in there somewhere okay cuz I missed it I must be but it is in there so that's good far be it for me to uh, pass up an opportunity to say more words included mm -hmm. with your staff report is the draft text of the platform in full uh, in an effort to uh, uh, streamline your presentation today I, I didn't put every uh, every little word into the slides Maybe. but yeah it, it found in the the last page of the the document there uh, we have three special topics cleared out okay. one of which is the charter school language we just discussed okay I, I breezed through that I went to the the meat and potatoes that you had so thank you I just wanted to make mm -hmm. sure 
And then the other thing I wanted to say, and I just, I think it's important, um, charter, I'm not against charter schools, okay? They, they serve a wonderful purpose, great. I'm against for profit any kind of school. I, I'm most definitely, especially when the profit goes out of the state, I'm, a, I'm most definitely against that. So I don't have a problem with this. And I just, I want to add something to the absenteeism rate for charter schools. I think we absolutely need to keep in mind the parents choose those charter schools. The parents know they're responsible for getting that child to the charter school. I, I, we're not comparing an apple to an apple. Um, if, if a parent is choosing something and they're being told you are going to be responsible for getting your child to the school, I, I would expect that the absenteeism rate is a lot lower than what we're seeing in public schools. I just, I would expect that. The parent is already choosing that relationship with that charter school. And that's what we're going to be trying to do in the public school is have the parents choose the relationship with us. We supply the buses. We cut down the walk zones. We added uh, busing to innovations. So I don't think it's fair to say, well, look at our charter schools. They only have 10% um, absenteeism rate. Well, of course they do because the parents choose that relationship and the parents have already made the commitment that they're going to get and quite frankly I'm actually surprised that it's even as high as 10 percent because the parents are choosing that so I I, I I don't think that argument holds water I'm sorry trustee church but that argument does not hold water that they're choosing a relationship they're choosing that commitment we're going to be working on that in public schools, but I don't like charter schools working for profit and most recently charter schools that are taking the profit out of our state. So that, that's my two cents. Thank you. But thank you for your hard work. This is excellent. Okay. Thank you. Are you going? Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, thank you. And another thing. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so a couple of real quick points uh, I just want to get on the record. You, you talk about, um, in, I'm working off of this sheet, yes, right? Sir. So this is a sheet that we would essentially adopt that would we would uh, very high level, uh, uh, broad um, legislative platforms. And there's, there's uh, empowering our personnel, compensation. I know we had record-breaking uh, compensation in the last legislative session. Uh, I think we all are wise enough to know that that's not going to happen, at least to that extent, in 2025. But uh, for those of our staff that are listening, please know that we're going to continue to fight for you for compensation. So I, I hope that we can continue to move down that path and um, uh, do do what we can to, to increase that 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 pie of, uh, of education dollars. The second piece I talked a lot about early on is, is specifically the special education. Um, and uh, I, I know we want to keep this, this high level. I just, Mr. Shaver, I just don't see it really called out specifically. Um, and that's, that's, for me, that's a little bit of a, of, of a, of a missing piece. Uh, and so I, I'd like to suggest maybe some language, but I'll, I'll let you I'll let you kind of work through that. Uh, empowering our personnel, licensing flexibility, uh, again, streamline. And again, I'm just throwing this out. Um, streamline licensing requirements and create path and create pathways for general and special education professionals to enter the field. There was one time when the state offered some incentive to special education teachers um, in, a, in a form of, of some sort of, I think, higher performing special ed teachers receive some extra compensation. So uh, to, to the extent that we can 
that, that, that we can make it more attractive and incentivize our current workforce to transition into special ed to the extent that they want to and those that want to enter the field. I was at a middle school last week, and, I, and we've done a great job of, uh, thanks to Superintendent Ernst and his team, making sure that we have enough teachers at the start of this year, general education teachers, right? But we're, we're, still in, we're still lacking special ed teachers. And I was at a, a middle school last week where there was one special education teacher uh, with some students that had real severe uh, needs. And this teacher uh, couldn't even take a lunch break. I mean, she, couldn't, she could not leave her, her, uh, her classroom. So uh, rather be uh, teachers or assistants and aides, I, I just hope we can find some language to make that more attractive. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Go ahead. It does. And Vice President Mayberry, my suggestion would be, <clears throat> and we could, you know, work on this in tandem together since we're on, like, the 99% line. Yeah. Look through this document while we continue our comments with uh, Trustee Nicolette and with public comment. And if you see an area where we could just add in, you know, and special education, you know, to provide that focus in one of these areas, you can make a motion for that inclusion, oh, okay. we would pass that inclusion, and then if the board so chose to pass the entire item, that would be after, just like when we make incremental changes. So we could do that right now in real time. So if you wouldn't, I mean, you certainly don't have to, yeah. but you can look right here, see where you'd like to insert that, and then we could consider that as, as a motion in and of itself, and then there would still be a motion to potentially adopt or, or to defer. Um, but we can do that right now. Yeah, no, here. fair enough. Mm -hmm. and, and I've been I've been trying to do exactly that. I appreciate that. And if Mr. Shaver has any suggestions, I'm open to that as well. But yeah, I, I don't I don't want to be the dead horse. No, and we, we can talk about it right now. We do have to go not right now because we're going to go to Trustee Nicolette. And but first, I'm going to go to Mr. Shaver. But we'll do public comment. And after that point, we could make a motion at that point for a specific inclusion. Uh. Uh, Madam President, I owe uh, uh, Vice President Mayberry an apology because he, this has been so important for him, and, and, and we made the, the, the critical mistake on, on our end of, of sort of including the concept without including the words. So you can see sort of woven through the importance when we talk about funding strategically. Uh, but, but, but you're right, I, I did a search of the whole document for the phrase special education, and we, we just didn't include it. Uh, to that end, uh, at a minimum, uh, under the uh, uh, title of creating space for students to thrive, uh, the bullet point labeled equity and access, uh, we would, uh, I'd recommend just, just again from my seat right here, uh, address opportunity g gaps and then change the end of that sentence to and expand access to pre-K and special education programs. Uh, uh, we think that, that there's an access, uh, uh, that access is there is, is pretty critical. As it relates to special topic number three as well, I'm not going to recommend any language changes, though, though you certainly may. Uh, your bill draft request as approved and submitted to, to the LCB does include uh, the transition that you just brought up, making it easier for, for people who want to weave sort of between special education and, and, and the traditional classroom, sort of limiting barriers that would allow them to do that. So that's already in your bill draft, and I think between though, that change and that bill draft, we might accomplish what you're looking for. And again, I, I hope you accept my apology for not uh, even more clearly. No, you're fine. I, I was. I apologize. I was a little distracted. What, uh, you, you were talking about the current bill draft. Can you can you say that again, please? Yes, sir. Of course. Uh, so the bill draft, as we have submitted, it does include the the concept that you just brought up, making it easier for for teachers to move into special education if that's what they want, and for those other professionals, if they want to become more traditional teachers, give them that opportunity as well. And um, just to make sure that I captured this correctly, potentially after Trustee Nicolette and after public comment, on the second page where we have the section creates space for students to thrive, the, yep, that one would end, expand access to pre-K and special education programs. That's right. Okay. Okay, so we'll we'll keep that filed. We're going to go to Trustee Nicolette, and then JJ will go to public comment. Thank you for your continued work on this. It's uh, 
a brainstorming session, I'm certain. We're at a nexus here, and I'm looking at uh, slide number six in the PowerPoint, revisiting charter schools. And again, we are at a nexus here, and I will say that I struggle a little bit with the portion that says discontinue the use of for-profit educational management operators. Um, I, I am very much for, again, back to the nexus, we are at a spot where we need to really be reflecting on um, how we equitize and equalize per pupil spending. And, and it, is, it is a big discussion, and I don't know if we are ready, we as, a, as, as a communities in Nevada are ready to have this deep dive of a conversation, because there are many, many components. Um, I see families and students and employees when I think about this concept, and again, discontinue the use of for-profit educational management operators. I, I don't like that concept because that is free enterprise. And it, whether we like it or not, education is big business. Having said that, again, back to the equalization and equitization of how monies are used, I absolutely fully embrace the beginning Ensure taxpayer-funded educational opportunities follow a consistent set of rules, in my mind, NRS and NAC, standards and oversight that demand the protection of public resources. Further, that opportunities that may arise from charter schools be available to all students. Therein lies, to me, another rub in that there is a different intentionality. And I'm just going to say it. Public school doors are open to everyone. Charter school doors, I know they try to be open to everyone, but there are certain guardrails and certain thresholds that they get to make choices and I respect that, and I honor that. And again, I repeat, our doors are open to every student. Public school doors are open to every student. And so I, I absolutely um, can embrace, again, the opportunities are consistent. Those are legislative decisions that I hope our legislators can deep dive and really beat up and come to a point where we can realize that we are pitting each other against each other with the student as the victim in the middle. So that's my two cents. I, I cannot, excellence for all students on this slide, I cannot give a yay for discontinue the use of for-profit educational management operators. I can have a deeper dive into the equitization and the equalization. And that's a different discussion, and I know I've, I've muddied things, but that's feel very strongly about that. Thank you. All right, let's go to public comment, JJ. Eddie Abelson. Welcome, Mr. Abel, sir. All right. Honorable members of the Washoe County School District Board, for the record, my name is Dr. Eddie Abelisser. I'm the CEO of Tri Strategies. We're a public relations firm, and we have the privilege of representing three public charter schools here in Northern Nevada. I want to address the issues that you are discussing today regarding uh, legislation that could establish consistent rules, standards, and oversight to protect public resources. If your goal is to implement a unified framework for public charter schools and district schools, we welcome that commitment. The public charter school community encourages district schools to align itself with the laws outlined in NRS 388A and to adhere to the stringent regulations that govern public charter schools. These are regulations that tr traditional district schools such as yourself are not bound to follow. 
Public charter schools are held to the same laws as traditional district schools, but we also face additional reporting requirements to the State Public Charter School Authority. This ensures that we meet high standards for student achievement. For instance, under regulation, if a charter school receives a one or two star rating for three consecutive years, it faces closure. This tradition, traditional district schools do not face that same level of accountability. Furthermore, public charter schools are required to notify parents if their school is underperforming, providing them with information about alternative education options in the community when their star rating falls be below a three. We encourage Washoe County School District to adopt similar transparency and accountability measures. Regarding um, concerns about public funding, I want to clarify that public charter schools are funded by taxpayer dollars. They're held accountable to the same taxpayers and should a charter school close, all of its assets um, revert back to the public. The notion that they operate as privately held entities is very misleading. Many charter schools must lease space from private landlords. They do not receive specific taxpayer funding for capital expenditures. So to that point, if you care about that, we urge the Washoe County School District to support legislation that allows public charter schools to access facility funding to build their own schools rather than being at the mercy of private landlords. Finally, I want to address this issue of for-profit education management organizations uh, in statute. And all it is is another name for private services provider. That's all they are. It is important to note that public charter school boards vote in a public setting such as yourself. They make decisions to hire private companies, very similar to what you all did today. You approved almost $7 million going to private entities in your board meeting today. <laughs> public charter schools do the same because you can't hire staff to do small projects. You have to hire a private company, such as a lobbying firm, to do this type of work. The Washoe County School District should be working with public charter schools in Nevada, not creating political divides based on false narratives. Uh, public, charters, public schools in Nevada. Thank you so much, Mr. Abel, sir. If it's OK, I'll submit my records and comment to the board. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The board received an email from Gil Lopez. All right. Vice President Mayberry, now that we're on the other side of public comment, um, we do have your suggestion, which Mr. Shaver um, suggested for that inclusion. I do have it written down. I don't know if you do too, but if you were interested, yes. we could go ahead and take a swing at that addition. I'm absolutely, uh, thank you for your assistance on that. I'm, I think that does the job for me. Um, equity and, and access, uh, this is on page two. Do you want me to read into the record? Is, uh, do you want me to make a motion? Yes, because you'll make the motion or okay. it, you have the option to make a motion um, under the section create space for students to thrive. Okay. The fourth bullet um, to slightly adjust that ending um, yeah, so I, I do move if we can uh, just add some language. You're right at the fourth bullet point under create space for students to thrive. Fourth bullet point would read as follows equity and access, colon, ensure equitable access to education, address opportunity gaps, and expand pre K and special education programs. I second. All right. All right. So we have a motion by Vice President Mayberry, seconded by Trustee Woodley. Seeing no other lights on, I think, for that conversation. Oh, Trustee Church, is your question, this is not for the whole platform, this is just for the one edition. Okay. Yes, I won't go into great detail, just uh, technicalities on that, I'm gonna be a no on this particular thing as well. Okay, very good. All right, so with discussion over, all those in favor of that edition, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All right. Motion carries. And now we can go on to the entirety of the platform. Um, now that we've done the single item, we can go to the entirety of the platform. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the Board of Trustees. Yeah, okay. Approves a draft 2025-2026 Washoe County School District Legislative Platform. 
has revised. Thank you. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, very good. So we have a motion by Trustee Woodley, a second by Vice President Mayberry. We will have discussion in the motion. Go ahead, Trustee Dr. Diane Nicolette. I thank you. Just to be very clear, it is that uh, one page, two sided draft that does not include revisiting charter schools. I think JJ has control of, of the slide here, and it is at the bottom of that uh, uh, draft there, special under the special topics. You have three there, and one is the charter school language, as uh, discussed earlier. One is a the item on testing and reporting we brought up at the last meeting, and then uh, the third is just a synopsis of the bill draft you're submitting to LCB. Thank you. So to be clear, the portion that um, uh, I cannot stand behind is included in what will move forward as our platform. Unless you change it here tonight, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have a motion by Trustee Woodley. We have a second by Vice President Mayberry. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. 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 Motion carries four to two. Thank you so much, Mr. Shaver. We appreciate your work, and thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a wonderful evening, and thank you again for your service. Thank you. All right, team, that closes item 3.07 and brings us now to our last item of this section, item 3.08. This is the presentation and discussion on a summary of past, present, and future activities for Washoe County School District Energy and Sustainability Program. This is an item for presentation and discussion only. And in front of us, we have our Chief Operating Officer, Adam Searcy. Um, before we go to COO Searcy, a little bit of background on how this item came to this board. So for those who do watch our proceedings, you know that any two trustees can request an item to be discussed. And a few months ago, Clerk Rodriguez and Trustee Woodley brought forward some questions, concerns, and thoughts about wanting to talk openly with our community about our commitment and the work that's been done in this area. And so we're very grateful for them. This item is at their request. And prior to COO starting this presentation, I'd like to defer first to Trustee Woodley to talk a little bit about the inspiration for this item. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, first, I just want to uh, thank you for, because uh, I did ask you in the previous item to allow me to make the motion, and I got distracted. I have a sick kid at home, but thank you for seeking me out so I can make that motion. Now back to 3.08. Um, that is correct. Uh, Trustee Rodriguez and I, we had discussion um, when we talked about um, uh, uh, um, sustainability and uh, uh, energy within the district, we talked about how we have such a huge footprint in the community. Uh, being an organization with over 7,000 employees, over 100 buildings, some of our buildings, most of our buildings are two, three, even four square, uh, square blocks of a city. So acknowledging that and knowing that, we've had discussion, we even spoke with um, Senator Rosen on one of her visits about that. And um, so I had interest, and so does he. I'll be honest with you. He had um, a little bit more in-depth interest. My big interest was, hey, are we um, recycling enough, and are we using LED lights on all our buildings? <laughs> the report you gave us was mind-blowing. It was like, wow, I didn't know that we did all those things. So thank you very much for uh, bringing forward this um, very in-depth uh, report. We really appreciate that. And um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Searcy. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Adam Searcy, for the record. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this topic and the emphasis on this, the scale um, that this organization uh, has and the impact that we can have on the community. So. I'm going to run through a lot of information quickly. We do a lot of things and then open it up for some discussion, but wanted to just frame this up for context a little bit. Um, I thought this was re revealing um, last fiscal year on these aspects of our 
uh, school district, we spent 18.5 million total. Uh, these are general fund dollars. Okay, so really, I think important to note that 55% of which are going to heating and cooling our buildings primarily, gas and electric, um, similar to your own homes, right? Think of it in that context. You've got um, waste disposal, sewer, internet, things like that. But on the scale that we operate, um, really, really significant and also really great opportunities to impact through our partners. A little bit more background, I want to start with board policy. Um, board policy 7400 um, is relatively new and relatively um, broad as policies go. It really speaks to a, a, a large range of opportunities and initiatives that are important to this organization that our staff and our um, students can focus on from air pollution to noise pollution to recycling and also to integrate that into our curriculum, work with our students to try to perpetuate that. Um, this, this program is really led by a singular position. Many of you knew Dr. Jason Geddes, who really was the uh, author of that board policy and the, the sole uh, prior occupant of that particular position, which um, unfortunately he couldn't be here tonight. Hopefully he's watching, but we recently uh, signed a young man up to help fill those shoes, and it will be wonderful to have a fresh set of eyes um, on this important work. Ultimately, um, I think a theme that I want to emphasize throughout tonight is that Board Policy 7400 describes that this is very much a shared responsibility um, that all of us hold all the way through our students and our community members. So focusing on some of the areas that our district really does um, expend these resources and has opportunities to tighten our belts in our transportation department. Some astonishing facts, 4.7 million miles driven by our school district police, uh, transportation department last year. Um, roughly, that's 20,000 miles a day. Just to put that into context, these are eye-popping numbers. Really, really impressive, the size and scale and logistics. Um, it's also really expensive. If you notice on that previous slide, um, over $3 million in fuel alone just for that fleet, 20% um, of which are non-diesel fuels. So primarily propane, we're gonna talk a little bit later about our electric buses. Also a significant um, utility expense basically of our district and waste generator is our IT. Every year, the scope and scale of our IT grows in our society and in our schools. Um, we manage those, we invest in replacing those and we thoughtfully recycle those. Um, that hopes to become a small revenue generator um, as you know, those batteries and those components become ever more valuable in our society. Um, but I also wanted to mention on that initial slide that we pay about a half a million dollars a year for internet, that we have Wi-Fi in all of our school facilities across the district and our consumption of bandwidth or data at all of our schools grows every year. Um, and that's, that's an area of focus for us. Along with our nutrition services program, I wanted to uh, kind of level set, pr provide some orientation to what we do do, starting with the scale of that program. Eight million meals served last school year across the entire district. That broken down on a school day basis is about 44,000 meals a day across the entire district. Um, always room for improvement, but important to note that all of our middle schools and high school meals are scratch cooked on site daily. The ingredients are delivered and the staff actually prepares the pizzas, cooks them in the ovens and then uh, itemizes them up and serves them. Um, the elementary schools, of course, many of you have toured our central kitchen where very efficient um, portioning and pre-packaging are then shipped to each of our schools for distribution. This is done in partnership with our vendor partner, Aramark. Um, who brings industry expertise and national best practices across from across the nation, all fit within the National School Lunch Program framework. I say, I emphasize that because, you know, that is a very stringent program that is subsidized by the federal government to allow us um, to provide nutrition on such scale. Um, they, they require, it's, it's heavily audited, right? They require for us to claim a meal that 
you know, certain elements of that meal be distributed to every student, right? You can't just have a cookie and call it lunch, which is a good thing. Uh, but to mitigate that and to provide flexibility, especially in mitigating waste, right? You got to take the entire meal, but you only eat the cookie. You're going to throw the rest away. Hey, national best practice in this photo here represents what they call a share table. And this is United States Department of Agriculture. Hey, you're not going to eat your um, apple, your milk, your, your applesauce, whatever it is. And it's, you know, something that you can pass forward. Other kids can go grab those. Uh, those are in all of our elementary schools. At the middle school, they have a similar program, and this, again, is sanctioned by the National School Lunch Program. They call it Offer Versus Serve. So, you know, you have to take, there's five elements of a, a menued meal. You have to take three of the five, something like that, to give the kids some choice, not force them to take everything, reduce some waste, and give them, you know, some utility in this. So there's a lot more to discuss on this one, uh, but I'm going to come back to all of these on future slides. So diving a little bit more into our facilities, I wanna talk about reclaimed water. It's an important issue in the high desert and where we live. Um, it's something that we enjoy and take advantage of everywhere we can. We have um, 11 of our schools currently plugged into um, non-potable recycled water. Um, that saves the district, consider it's about half the, the price of um, the irrigation rate that we pay at our other schools. I wanted to highlight too, I noted we got a number of public written public comments this evening from students, particularly at Galena High School. Um, Galena's a good one on this point, access to and the use of reclaimed waters limited to public infrastructure. We have tried multiple times to get together with Washoe County. The system, the, the non-potable irrigation network um, is like right across the road, of, right across Mount Rose Highway. You know, so it costs a couple million dollars to drag that utility up to Galena High School campus. Um, so putting together the right group of partners or customers on our side of Mount Rose Highway has been the challenge. But someday I would expect um, we'll get there. Um, on that note, uh, so it was wonderful to get those emails from our students. And um, the genesis of that was they had reached out to me few weeks ago. Um, so they are members of a group. Um, there's quite a few Galena students, although there are also students um, from across district high schools. They are the WCSD electrification team and sustainability. And they wanted to talk about these very topics. And I was so proud because when I did meet with them last week, they shared their concerns, they shared their passions, the things they wanted to advocate for. And team, I know you're watching this, either tonight or you're gonna watch the recording. So Riley and team, I know you're watching this. And they were just blown away that we did so much of this. Now, I didn't have this presentation quite yet, but I told them it was coming out on the Thursday. And then I encouraged them to look it over, to watch this presentation. And they're actually gonna be reforming their areas of advocacy because they were so impressed that we were doing so many of these things. And I want you to know um, on behalf of me and our facilities team and the entire district that it felt great to have a conversation with this passionate group of students that were actually very impressed and pleased with the work that's been done and enough so that they're going to reform what they wanna advocate around still in this space because we have accomplished so much already. So kudos to you and the team and to the electrification team that's watching right now, we can't see, can't wait to see what you advocate for next. I appreciate that context and would really uh, look forward to an opportunity in engaging with them. Also take the opportunity to acknowledge a number of our community partners um, and utilities who are um, here in support of us this evening. Um, NV Energy, Waste Management, I believe Tumwa, um, a couple of our vendor partners, Aramark, McKinstry, you'll hear about later, was also represented. Um, uh, many of them serve in some form or fashion on a nonprofit organization known as Envirolutions, um, who often bring curriculum opportunities into our schools. So, you know, these are the types of collaborative endeavors. Even uh, one of our friends um, from colloquially known as the Green Team, I believe, is here in support. And that's the type of um, engagement and um, input that continues to drive us towards uh, better and better outcomes. So anyway, diving on a little bit more what we do now, solar energy. Um, many might be surprised to be 
to know that 36 of our schools have some form of solar arrays installed. Um, nearly 10%, 7.5% of our total district energy consumption was uh, provided through solar energy and more of that to come as well. We also have significant geothermal energy use in our schools. Um, 14 of our schools are heated and cooled primarily on the backs of the passive energy stored within our earth. Uh, this is a photo of the construction at Hug High School. And so now if anyone goes to visit Hug High School, all that dirt area is basically uh, baseball, softball, soccer fields. But underneath those fields are approximately 400 individual wells that are nearly 400 feet deep and are interconnected by a loop that circulates fluid and passively exchanges or extracts heat from the constant temperature of the earth below those ball fields, brings it back into the building and allows us to modulate the temperature inside the building for pennies on the dollar. So 14 of our schools today are heated and cooled in that way. It is a dramatic cost savings. Um, here I define the acronym EUI, you'll see that used repeatedly as opposed to kilowatt hours or dollars per square foot. It's sort of, a, as it says there, a, a crude measurement of efficiency. And this is our preferred HVAC system, which as I began with, is the predominant driver of expenditures, right? Gas and electricity um, are really our primary expenditures. So when we can plug into that free energy of the earth, we do it. And then once we actually operate our schools, we re really leverage technology as well. So this is also something that many are surprised to understand that in every single one of our schools, we have uh, a building automation controls, basically a digital system that allows us to monitor the operation, monitor and control the operations of the majority of the HVAC components. That's temperature settings, on and off fans, things like that, and make adjustments when they're either out of occupancy or um, not working correctly. This is an area that I'll come back to as well where small changes on the scale that we operate can really have a significant impact. So that's kind of the baseline that I wanted to set up and then going forward we're talking about the, the, the changes that we have been able to accelerate our program really once WC1 passed. And we weren't just worried about plugging the holes in the roof. We we're able to make really aggressive changes that save us money. So it started really in 2017 with um, these energy retrofit projects. This was a comprehensive audit of all of our schools, identifying uh, energy saving opportunities. And then the capital funded implementation, over $30 million touching every single one of our schools. So literally go down that list full LED fluorescent lights conversion district-wide, not only does that save us money, but that improves the quality of the learning environment, right? Just dimly lit rooms, spaces, shadows, that stuff, that matters. That was repaired, that was fixed, that was improved in every classroom in our building um, quite a few years ago now. We also made adjustments, uh, programmable thermostats, that allows us to improve the, the consistent thermal comfort also. That matters inside the learning environment to the best of our ability. You see low flow fixtures. So these are flushing toilets, most of the sinks as well. You don't think about it when you pull that handle, whatever. If it's not set to, you know, it gets out of sync, you're wasting a half a gallon that you shouldn't be wasting. That type of stuff saves us money, conserves water. And then the last couple really speak to just intelligent management. You know, you're looking at huge reams of invoices on utility bills, negotiating on scale with some of these utilities and our local governments, sewer providers, et cetera. Hey, how can we do this a little bit smarter and then continue to, to monitor and optimize how we actually manage these programs, saving pennies every step of the way. And on scale, we're talking about real money. How much real money? We're talking about $2 million a year saved. These are general fund dollars on the backs of these improvements. These are actual avoided costs, right? So money that we would have otherwise spent had we not done this. Every year, these are basically perpetual, right? No additional investments required. We're just mitigating any cost increases that the market 
might throw at us. And then, of course, last but not least, uh, improve learning conditions. Oh, I should also flag NB Energy, you know, incentivizes many customers to do this work. So since we've done this, it's been audited and verified to NB Energy that, you know, it's doing what we said to do. They actually provide us a rebate for this. So over the course of all these years now, over a million dollars in direct incentives have been paid from NB Energy back to the school district, which we then reinvest in these types of projects. I mentioned earlier the intelligent management that some of these control systems allow us to bring to bear. This is all demonstrated on a publicly available dashboard. So this is a tool, if any student or any citizen in our community is, in, is there's a, a live link, if it works on that PDF, or it's readily available drilling in through our building's website to find this dashboard. Very customizable, you can look at it from all different angles. It's smarter than I can handle, but if you're a real whiz, you can look at kilowatt hours of solar, gas, electricity, et cetera, et cetera, for every individual school, see large trend lines. And that's the front, the public facing dashboard that we basically look at behind the scenes to monitor the, act, the, the expenditures, the consumption that's taken on at all of our buildings. This is also a tool that's used often by the, our partner, Environmental Envirolution, when they go into those classrooms, you can zoom, out and zoom in on an individual school and create a lesson out of real-time data that you know, we're tracking and using to actually manage these facilities. So pretty neat there. Also something that W, so that was, that was really three slides just on those energy retrofit projects that are ongoing. The capital renewal program that we come to the board and talk about often, um, has a couple different components that are relevant here. First of all, we're replacing pieces and parts. We've got a 20-year-old boiler, a 25-year-old air conditioning system. We need to replace it. The building's fine, whatever. We need to replace the component. Uh, we need to replace the windows. All of that stuff improves the energy efficiency of the building. So that is always moving our, our building system in the right direction. Um, we also are continuously monitoring and upgrading our control system. So um, these, these little irregularities, when we catch them when they're small, we can make small adjustments and really save the district uh, dollars and improve learning conditions in the, in the classroom. That's ongoing. Obviously, we're also building and replacing new schools. So every one of our new schools since 2017 built with all of these high performance standards the, the building envelope, the roofing, the HVAC system, the windows, all of it, modern standards. We're not just replacing one element. You can see by generation, the newer technologies, the newer materials, the newer design standards lead to much 50% more efficient buildings um, that have all been built in recent years. And then the facility modernization, I wanted to highlight O'Brien as a case study. We were able to plug in to the previously unavailable non-potable irrigation system there, dramatically improved building envelope. We've got more windows, less air transfer, much more efficient system, and then underneath the parking lot that you see there and actually under that storm drainage detention basin, hundreds of those wells that I mentioned are at Hug High School as well. 50% reduction in overall EUI energy consumption rate. As we continue with this, I also wanted to highlight, well, pardon me, um, moving on to the transportation. I mentioned this earlier, the scale of this fleet is just tremendous. Um, but similar to replacing the components of our school facility infrastructure, uh, we look at upgrading to modern diesel buses. So even just as simple as replacing a 10 or 15 year old bus with a brand new diesel bus is still a dramatic improvement in the cleanliness, you know, the, the, the dirtiness of the exhaust is dramatically improved with modern technology and more well-functioning piece of equipment. This is also a part of our CIP, our Capital Improvement Program. This really wouldn't be possible at the pace that we're moving today um, without, the, you know, the increased uh, resources in WC1. 
we've also this is a photo of our newest electric school bus we had acquired two electric school buses about a, a little over a year ago um, put them into service and honestly you know it was a pilot program for a reason there are a lot of growing pains throughout the energy uh, industry um, but has not deterred us um, You'll hear in a couple of months the probable expansion or renovation of the central transportation yard. That's going to include several dozen um, charging stations for future electric school bus fleet electrification and expansion of that. Um, I mentioned 20% approximately, something like 70 of our buses are fueled by propane, um, and we leverage other grant funds. Um, stemming from like diesel emission settlements with Volkswagen, things like that, um, to, to replace older, dirtier buses with newer buses, things like that. Always an area that we're trying to improve. Um, the last thing I'll mention ab about our transportation department also pertains to technology. Leveraging ever smarter routing systems to maximize the efficiency that we are using our tools. It's one thing to have efficient tools. It's other thing to use them as smartly as possible, and we're making strides there as well. Again, circling back to nutrition services, tremendous scale. It's very, very important that we serve as many students as possible, as efficiently as possible, and with the highest quality as possible. It's really you know, a challenging balance. Um, but one that we always seek to improve every place that we can get. We, I want to emphasize that wherever possible, paper trays are used in our individual, you know, some entrees won't tolerate um, a paper tray when it's reheated at a school, but paper trays are used whenever possible. The plastic wrapping that we um, ship our elementary school meals in is made from uh, post-consumer recycled material that is certified BPA-free. And trash compactors, actually, you mentioned, you saw on the opening slide a significant bill every month is sent to waste management. Across all of our sites, we have trash compactors because they pick up, you know, basically on volume, right? The number of times they got to touch that dumpster, whether it's full or empty, is a thing. So we work hard to, to, to optimize there. But we also look to reduce our waste um, to the extent possible. So... On that end, we've been working with uh, a number of schools and a number of partners really over the last school year to try a couple different ideas out. And one of the ideas that, that worked well and that I want to um, kind of unveil and announce tonight that we're going to be implementing on scale is a complete elimination uh, throughout the rest of this school year of these styrofoam trays. So these are used in all of our schools. And last year we tried out using a paper boat, they call it. And this just, this just contains the food as they pick it up through the line and take it back to their seat, and they often have individual containers as well. There's not a, an appreciable difference in functionality in these. There's not an appreciable difference in cost in these. It worked well at an individual school. And beginning after fall break, we're going to be burning through our existing inventory and eliminating the use of styrofoam throughout the district effective immediately. The other element that we have in all of our school cafeterias are these spork kits. So these are neatly prepackaged, um, uh, you know, goodie bags of a napkin, a disposable plastic spork, and a tiny little straw. Not everybody needs all of these things, and they certainly don't need this. So also effective immediately once we burn through our existing inventory, we're going to be transitioning to really a self-service where we have a disposable plastic spork, which is a very, very cost-effective, valuable tool in this type of an ecosystem, an individually selected napkins, as well as individually selected straws, which are frequently not used or needed. So little things that don't need to be introduced into the system unless on demand. These are the types of small, intelligent adjustments that we are able to make while still balancing that cost model to serve as many students as possible. Um, in no small part because of uh, the input from our community partners and um, the hard work of our Aramark team and our nutrition services team to be open to that type of input. The other thing, I don't want to gloss over, I don't have the nifty visual aid for, 
but we are going on a smaller scale. These are going to be district-wide changes that we're going to be implementing. On a much smaller scale, we're going to be trying out some reusable cutlery. This is dishwashing. This is actual silverware that the kids are going to turn back in. They're not going to throw it in the garbage can by accident. <laughs> and then we're going to rinse them off and wash them. And this is a labor issue. This is a health department issue. This is a lot, lot harder than people may realize that it is. Um, but we're going to try it out. We're going to try it out on a small scale, and we're going to see how we do. But we're going to try it for real this semester. I'm pretty excited about that, too. So just a couple more slides. This is a big one, though. We can move the needle uh, the furthest, the fastest in our facilities management department. And this is, this is an area that I'm pretty excited about for the future. Um, of course, our capital renewal program is going to continue replacing boilers across the district, et cetera. But the facilities modernization program, as you guys are well aware, is going to be dramatically improving existing schools and replacing them all across the district very intensively. One of the aspects that is now um, a standard mandatory aspect in these projects is student STEM engagement. So we're going to be bringing these construction projects into the classroom, whether they relate to energy and sustainability or just teach a kid something about the exciting aspects of these projects. That's something I wanted to highlight. The other thing um, that I wanted to highlight on here that's sort of represented by that screenshot from Facebook 2021 is a community solar program that NV Energy is also sponsoring. Um, that we're going to be applying for and hope to um, receive approval for. Lots of opportunities to add solar to our facilities. If you guys are familiar with the new Moana Springs pool and the beautiful solar arrays that are over the parking lot right next to those soccer baseball fields, those were funded through this exact program. In fact, I think this, this, um, this effort here for SWOPE came in second to the, to the good folks at the City of Reno there, but we've got some some uh, some really strong candidates, and we're thinking possibly even putting those types of uh, solar arrays um, that you see over parking areas on playgrounds where that shade can have a dual purpose. You know, it's one thing to shade the cars. I want to shade the kids while they're playing on the playground. These are ideas. These are applications. These are just ways that we're trying to integrate more solar into our the next and more significant way that we're looking to leverage is related to the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's a huge omnibus bill that included um, elements from really all walks of society, but huge provisions um, for direct rebates on elements such as our geothermal HVAC system. So literally as we speak, we're working with a specialized tax advisor to apply for what we anticipate will be at minimum $350,000 of direct rebate to us for the construction that we did at Jay Wood Raw in the form of that um, geothermal ground source HVAC system. Through the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, we are actually going to receive a rebate for the work that we're doing anyway. Going forward, knowing that those are available, we're actually going to be influencing our design to more aggressively take advantage of those types of rebates, specifically starting at Vaughn Middle School. Because there's already a building there, I don't, I'm not gonna have the opportunity to drill those wells, right? I gotta have a traditional HVAC system, that's fine. It's gonna be brand new, it's gonna be highly efficient, it's gonna be spectacular. But we are gonna put solar on the roof and we are gonna apply for this rebate opportunity and likely dramatically offset those costs. Same playbook at Loader where we're going to be designing solar installations because it now makes financial sense, and then we'll reap the benefits in terms of generating that electricity at our schools. So those are the big ones. Um, you all received word in your superintendent's highlights of some exciting gas-powered equipment um, partnerships that is, are uh, forthcoming in partnership with the um, local health department. Those are smaller scale, but that is something that's likely to be replicated at schools going forward as well, right? When we buy all the new um, lawn and garden equipment for Vaughn, it's going to be battery powered, because why not? And lastly, you know, just talking about how this circles back onto the kids, looking at those outdoor environments I mentioned, hopefully the, those shade structures. We're looking at other exciting things like partnering with different organizations around tree planting um, and even heat reflective paint. 
that we've seen in other urban areas that can brighten a space and also lower the surface temperature by a couple handfuls of degrees that really makes a difference. So that is a broad and fast overview. The conclusions, takeaways, really small changes can make a big impact. That's what makes this fun. You know, just finding the smallest opportunities can really add up and make a difference. It's not as daunting as you might think it is. Also wanted to mention continuous improvement. I enjoy that. I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the engagement um, and the push from the community because there is always an opportunity to do better. Um, I started with mention reference to the board policy 7400, the fact that sustainability is really everyone's responsibility. I'm the only one up here speaking right this minute, but we have a huge amount of partnership in our district, in our community, and of course in our schools, in our classrooms, and last but not least, our students are our best partners. These are the future leaders of our community. We instill these values in them. We open up their minds with some of these questions and inspire them to continuous improvement and solving problems that we've never even thought of. So that's a quick overview. I hope that was helpful. It was good for me as well to brush up on all this stuff. Mr. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. Um, like I've said previously, I honestly thought I was gonna, we were gonna get like two slides. <laughs> I honestly did not think it was gonna be 20 something slides. So we appreciate it immensely. Um, I do see waste management out in the audience. I know that they are uh, partners with many agencies and, and it feels good to see them here behind you. Um, didn't know if there was anything you wanted to say in particular, anything specific to um, working with waste management or any, any uh, I want to make sure they get a shout out and not just sit there all day. <laughs> I mean, I'll leave that to the discretion of the board. I invited a number of our community partners here, um, I, and, and they, they responded. I think That's awesome. their presence alone is representative of exactly. the relationship that we have. Exactly. Um, we get VIP access and service with all these folks, and we pay a considerable amount. Ultimately, um, they, they enjoy what they do a lot, and so I think the opportunity to engage and educate our students as well is something they're interested in. That's great. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, that's great news today about the trays. I like that, and 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 the sporks. That's uh, that's awesome, man. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I had no idea. I really just thought recycling, you know, papers over here, plastic over there, and some LED lights. But you educated <laughs> us on a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is amazing. Yeah, thank you, uh, Trustee Woodley. We we could have been out of here uh, 30 minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> I kid, I kid. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I was really happy to hear about the styrofoam and the plastics. I mean, we, I think we've all been getting emails about that, so what a blessing that is to get rid of the styrofoam. So thanks for really focusing in on that. I, I thought we would get there. I didn't think we would get there as fast as we did, so thank you for that. And then uh, on the buses, um, uh, propane is cleaner than diesel, right? So are, are, are we moving toward more buses? With propane, did, did, did I hear you correctly on that? It is cleaner than diesel. It's not as readily available. There's some there's some pros and cons. It's a it's a valuable tool in our toolbox, and we've been expanding our fleet there for some time. But I think it will likely stay on the minority end of the scale as far oh, well, as okay, okay. And uh, very impressive. Four point seven miles. There four point seven million miles. Uh, our buses take. I did. A little math and uh, came up with that's uh, two and a half times uh, two and a half trips to the moon and back. Yeah, I was pretty proud of myself. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this and to all of our partners that are out there. This was an outstanding item. Thank you to Clerk Rodriguez and to trust you we're asking for this I think this is so good that it should be on the website underneath you know facilities and sustainability this is good news uh, particularly the announcements and this team embraces it because you could do it the resistant way or you could run right into it and I love that this district uh, runs right into it and and we also are able to do that thanks to WC1 which allows us to rebuild these schools to make improvements, to make capital improvements that benefit our um, environment 
Um, and so just thank you. This was a wonderful, wonderful item, a great way to end this portion of the evening. So thank you so much. All right, folks, so that closes item 3.08 and section three in its entirety. And I'm gonna take a few liberties and move a few things around. So we will be doing board reports. However, um, I am going to open section four. We will start with Calvin for item 401, our student representatives report. And then I'm gonna pause section four and I will go to public comment. Um, just as a note to the community and anyone following along, if you noticed last meeting due to the Davis fire, we focused more so on essential or uh, time dependent items. And so we moved all of the balance of those items to tonight. So just so everyone knows, we will be doing item 401, our student representatives report, and then I will go to public comments. So we will still do board reports, but wanna make sure that we hear from our community since we are getting a little bit long, but a necessity because of um, two weeks ago. So on that, uh, Calvin, I'd like to in introduce you and invite you for item 401, our student representatives report. All right, um, so uh, we held our uh, district student voice meeting on Tuesday, 9-17, which was last Tuesday. And um, this month's meeting was held at Wooster High School. We started off by asking um, some of the representatives from each of the schools, um, how their, their student advisory councils within their schools were looking like. Most of them said that they had them up and going and it was going great. And the ones who didn't um, are working on starting up their own advisory councils within their schools. And then we moved on to talking about our three main topics, which are um, respect, student wellness, and college and career readiness. Um, each of the groups split up to talk about um, what their main focuses would be this year. And the respects group main talking point was to address several types of disrespect that they see within the schools. An example of this um, is how teachers have favorite students and how students have favorite teachers. And then um, the student wellness group, they discuss how they would like to see more school therapists and counselors and even if there could be possibly a physical therapist within the school. Um, another idea that they had was a way of connecting the schools by putting a mental health mural in each of the schools um, that give students support and have like positive quotes and maybe even some resources that they could use. Um, and uh, last but not least, we had the college and career readiness um, this group talked about how we can help high schoolers, um, freshmen through seniors, um, get better prepared for life after primary school and help them find different options on what they could do, such as military, a trade, or even just going straight into a career. Um, an, one of the main ideas from this group was to start a social media um, group, probably an Instagram account, uh, just to post like different options and more info on those options. And along with that, they would post resources such as Niche and College Vine, which would help students find scholarships and colleges that would uh, fit them the best. And after the groups talked, we came back together to discuss these topics, and that's where we wrap things up. Well, thank you so much, Calvin. We really appreciate it having you here. You are more than welcome to stay through the balance of the meeting, but if you also want to go, we understand that too. All right, thank you. But it was wonderful having you here with us. Thank you for having me. All right, so I'm going to pause the remainder of Section 4 and open Section 5, our closing items, and go to Item 501, our public comment, JJ. Colin Robertson. Welcome, Mr. Robinson. President Smith and Superintendent Ernst and trustees, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Colin Robertson. I am the Senior Vice President of Education and Research at the Nevada Museum of Art, um, and also a longtime and former president of the board of the Education Alliance of Washoe County. Um, where I got to know 
Trustee Woodley very well. Um, I come with a gift for each of you and one for Clerk Rodriguez in his absence as well. This is a teacher toolkit that my team has put together in relationship to the opening of our new exhibition at the Nevada Museum of Art called Deep Time Sea Dragons of Nevada, which brings together 25 fossil ichthyosaurs from 250 million years ago in Nevada. And you may know that that is the state fossil of Nevada. We have 25 of them on display, which haven't been seen by the public since they were excavated beginning in 1868 and 1905. Um, and they're really astonishing things to see um, and tell a really good story. But what I'm most proud of is that my team, working in collaboration with a great group of people from the Nevada Discovery Museum and from PBS Reno, collaborated on this, which is four lessons that are aimed primarily for third to fifth grade teachers with augmented materials for teachers from K through three and all the way into high school, plus a copy of our published children's book called Annie Alexander's Amazing Adventure in Nevada, which tells the story of the pioneering female paleontologist Annie Alexander, who everyone in Nevada should know but doesn't. And this is an effort to try to fix that. Um, this is an exhibition that's up for the course of the next school year, and we are working really hard to uh, collaborate across the district uh, to bring art and science in particular into conversation throughout this exhibition and through its run into January of 2026. So it's up through all of this uh, coming calendar year, which I'm, I'm really excited about. And the reason that that matters has to do with the runway into opening our new building, the Charles and Stacy Mathewson Education and Research Center, which we'll get the keys for by Christmas this year. and begin to open in phases to the public in March of 2025. Uh, very shortly thereafter, we'll host the Nevada STEAM conference there for educators across the state on Saturday, April 5th. And that's a space that I have uh, a lot of autonomy to use in collaboration with you. And I'll just say that I'll ask JJ to help me pass these out and thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. Joni Hammond. Welcome, Ms. Hammond. Good evening, President, Superintendent, and Trustees. I don't have any gifts for you, though. Thank you for recognizing our police, the Hispanic Heritage, and Constitution Day, all very deserving proclamations. I also love the new Foundation for Aviation Technology program at the Academy of Arts, Career, and Technology. What a boost for Washoe County Schools and the students that will get to attend that program. I also thank you for the step you took in recognizing the importance of attendance at school. I sincerely hope that this path will work. I also agree with Trustee Church that we need actionable measurable steps. What I did not hear was the importance of parents, grandparents, in other words, the child's family and how they can help. The relationship between attendance and academics was highlighted in the presentation. Also important to focus on basic academics, reading, writing, and math, things that make us successful in life. Whatever job you end up in, you need to be able to read, write, and do math. Please spend more time on academics. Thank you very much, Ms. Hammond. Sandy Tibbet. Welcome, Ms. Tibbet. So I really want to uh, thank the family members of the students who drove the three hours um, to address this board last month and commend the female students who found the strength to come before this board to voice their concerns about boys being allowed into the girls' locker room while they undress. 
It takes courage to stand up for your rights and redress your grievances to a government body who is supposed to listen and then act accordingly. I pray this board heard them and they do the right thing. Have you addressed their concerns? No. President Smith was very clear on how important it is for her to be a strong supporter for the rights of the LGBTQIA students during her pride speech this last June. So are the rights of the LGBTQIA students more important to you than the rights of the female students and their parents? It really appears that way, President Smith. Why doesn't she and this board clearly support the mental health and well-being of all students equally? Nobody's feelings supersede anyone's God, anyone else's God-given rights, and there is no law that makes what is wrong right. This board has the authority to stop this nonsense by exercising some common sense. Why would any of you with a daughter or granddaughter want a biological boy sharing a locker room with them? I don't want my granddaughter in a locker room with a boy changing. How are, you, how are any of you okay with being complicit in violating the rights of these girls? President Smith, quote, who you love and how you show up in the experience of love de deserves respect and acceptance. Don't you find her concern and support for a student's love experience weird? I do, it is weird and not appropriate topic for a school board trustee. The same virtue signaling speech while speaking about mental illness, she said, this is where our work sits. Your work. <laughs> what is your work exactly? Is it to indoctrinate the students? To destroy their mental health with DEI and gender ideology garbage? Soon you and your work will be irrelevant. Trump will be reelected to office and he will follow through with his promise to defund the districts who push DEI and gender dysphoria. What side of history does this board want to be on? How do you want your community to remember you? We the people demand the following be put on the agenda for discussion and action. Again, the challenge books, a board policy for library books, to terminate the ALA relationship, and admin regulation 5161 and parents' rights. Those need to be on the agenda for discussion and action. Thank you very much, Ms. Tibbet. Thank you, President Smith. Um, I, I signaled <laughs> Council Rombardo to make sure it would be okay for me to speak. Um, and please jump in if I'm overstepping or two things can be right at the same time. I think communities lose sight of that. And just because we don't advertise and put out on banners, um, newsletters, radio spots, what we're doing doesn't mean that we're not doing something. And I mean, to be fair to you, you wouldn't know. But work has been done, it has been addressed, and that's where I say two things can be right at the same time. I myself had a meeting with our council um, to, to discuss these things, and my concern was that all of our students, every single one of them, no matter what, be treated with dignity and respect, and if we could come up with a solution where none of our students were pushed out of their comfort zone and their needs were met respectfully and with dignity, two things can be right at the same time. And a solution was reached in this case. And I asked if it could be put into a policy, but, and I do agree with our council on this, every case is gonna be different. So if we box ourselves in to a stringent policy that might not fit in this particular case or this particular school. I can tell you that all of the students' needs were addressed and are handled and will be handled respectfully. Um, no one's going to left out, be left out. No one's going to have to feel uncomfortable. These are the things that get done behind the scenes. And sometimes, I, you know what, maybe we don't toot our horn enough. We did good work. 
We did good work. Okay? As for the books, that also was addressed. I personally and President Smith had probably six meetings, meeting with team members, several emails. I personally read every single one of those books. And to say that we don't take parents' voice seriously, that's, that's not the case. A form is going out from our English class teachers. It's on Connect Ed. It was being distributed at open houses where we're requesting parents to please return this document signed stating if you don't want your child to have access to specific genre. Because not everybody's opinion is the same. My idea of what is acceptable is going to be different from JJ's idea, from Trustee Mayberry. The best way to handle this is to put it and give the power to the parents to have a voice and advocate for their child. And that's what we did with the books. We're not moving books out. We're not moving books in. Parents have a voice to say, I do not want my child to have access to this reading material. And they won't. They won't have access. Because I am not going to dictate to a parent and say, your child is not going to have access to this, that, or the other. But I can certainly advocate for my child, and every parent is going to have that opportunity to say, I don't want my child having access to that. And I know that's not going to be enough for some. Some are going to think it's too much. Some are going to think that the, the schools and the librarians should, they know best. I'm saying parents know best. And that's, that's, I think, important, is for our parents to have a voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Westlake. And I share your opinion that parents know best. John Eppolito. Welcome, Mr. Eppolito. Hi, John Eppolito, Protect Nevada Children. I think what Colleen just said is in direct opposition to one of your board policies, the one that says if a staff or member finds out that the student is gay, they're not allowed to tell the parents. I think that's what you just said is in direct opposition, um, unless I'm misreading that uh, board policy. That's not what I wanted to talk about, though. What I wanted to talk about was the chronic absenteeism and Getting back to the same thing that I mentioned earlier, um, and it's the child, and that was a Pine Middle School that committed suicide last school year, that everybody kept quiet, that was getting tormented via social media, and tried to come to the, the parents, tried to come to the school, evidently the superintendent and the principal, and nothing was done. And I was thinking, I, I heard the conversation, even though I wasn't here, about the chronic absenteeism, and I know I've had three people tell me that the reason their kid doesn't come to school is because they're getting bullied on social media. That didn't come up at all. And I think that's something you guys need to consider because that's what's happening with these kids. And I know you don't want to hear it. You don't want to really know everything that's going on, but that's part of it. I don't know how big of a part. One of the three parents, it was more of, more of a physical thing, but two of them that talked to me, one was a grandparent, two of them that talked to me, it was because of social media. That's why their kid doesn't come back to school, because they get bullied. And I know it's not directly in your purview, but you guys have the platform. You have the, what's it called, parent university or whatever it's called. You guys should be training parents. Instead of making the problem worse by spending another million dollars on iPads, you should be telling parents the problems with these devices. And you just bury your heads in the sand. Maybe you're doing stuff behind the scenes. You should be asking us about it. You never do that. But it's very frustrating, and kids are getting hurt. And yeah, you guys sit up there, and it just pisses me off. I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say something else, but I get too excited. 
Uh, it's not on there. Well, it's probably not going to come into my head until I sit back down. But you guys really should be paying attention. Oh, I know what it was, the anxious generation. Um, how the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. I'm at the end of the fifth chapter, Jonathan Haidt, I guess. Um, he goes, quote, the great rewiring of childhood in which phone-based childhood replaced the play-based childhood is the major cause of international of the international ec epidemic of adolescent mental illness, end quote. This is what you guys should be talking about in parent university, instead of making things worse by just giving kids devices. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Epolito. Thank you. Bruce Foster. Welcome, Mr. Foster. Yes, hi, uh, President Smith, ladies and gentlemen of the uh, board. Uh, first off, the aviation technology is awesome. I know that when I was 19, it was a great sense of accomplishment when I got my private pilot's license. And then number two, you're uh, overlooking an incredible resource out there regarding the uh, issues of absenteeism, and that is dads and granddads that could volunteer their time in middle school, high school, and be able to be a mentor and also watch what's going on, uh, keep them from breaking toilets and uh, taking drags off of their uh, technologies that they bring in. And then also another point is that the difference between a charter school and a regular school is that they collect these, from what I understand, and then two, uh, they don't allow uh, pornography. And then uh, to Trustees uh, Westlake's uh, conversations, and then I want to say that it would be great if we had town halls, so there could be a two-way conversation. Uh, but I hopefully we can reverse the trend because four platforms you've been highlighted and you got the email from me, but I just wish to review. Uh, my word, uh, you've been uh, highlighted in InfoWars, uh, minor girls labeled transphobic after speaking out against uh, the LGBT and uh, on, on and on boys using their locker rooms, which you already uh, say you addressed. How about uh, the base mother talking about the same thing? That's in involved in uh, the Instagram, and uh, also uh, John Amartuku, you're highlighted in his next uh, documentary. Uh, and uh, that is going to be coming out in October, and uh, it's going to be featuring uh, basically 22 words exposing the loss of decency in American education. And, you know, Karen England, she says hi, uh, has uh, stated that Washington County School District has the most unfathomable, worst issue with pornographic books. And I don't know what kind of educational uh, product that c comes out of these books. You want to keep them in the libraries? Why? And you're going to have uh, basically... Uh, the featured guests, Kirk Cameron, Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson, Crystal Amachuku, uh, Bishop Patrick Lane, Wooden Sr., Benedict Boyles, and the list goes on. And so that's going to be available. And then, I'm sorry you missed the 1916 project, and this is a shirt that I got from them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. The board received emails from Lisa Wang. Conrad Moran, Riley Sherman, Eva Akpati, Emily Ho, Arisha Ho Houdin, Linda Miller, and Joyce Chen. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, um, that closes item 5.01, and we'll go back to board reports um, mm -hmm. and open item 5, I'm sorry, 4.02. And Trustee Church, I'll go to you first since we have you online. Thank you, and I'll be extremely brief. Uh, don't really have much to say or report uh, other than people that are concerned about some of the issues that came up today, the State Department of Education, the statewide Department of Education, 
meets October 2nd at 2 p.m. So you're always welcome. Uh, citizens can uh, make their points known there. They don't get as many attendees as we do. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Trustee Westlake. Thank you. Nothing too um, exciting because the exciting part of being a trustee is actually getting into the schools, which I'm starting this week, and I'm going to start by uh, a few school visits tomorrow and then reading to the kindergarten classes again at Sun Valley Elementary. But I was um, the primary caretaker for three of my grandkids, the two older twins, and I call the baby, he's 16 months old, Vance, I call him Mussolini because he's a total dictator. And so for a week I was doing that and then my husband and I went uh, to Mexico for our 35th wedding anniversary. So that was fun. There's, there's a picture of the, um, the resort we were at. And I, I needed that vacation after watching Mussolini for a week. <laughs> so thank you. I think I might have some pictures here. All right. Oh, thank you. So I attended not the last game, but the previous game, uh, football game, which we lost, unfortunately, at home. But I did have uh, the opportunity to hang out with some of our high school bands, and I specifically looked for the Lancers and took a photo with them. Oh, no, that's fine. So that was uh, McQueen uh, band. I also had the opportunity to um, attend and um, support and volunteer for raising funds at a golf tournament for Nevada Military Support Alliance. And we raised a couple thousands of dollars uh, to help our veterans and individuals in public safety and mental health. I also uh, attended a game for a Reed High School against Reno. And this is Kiomi Winters. She's a freshman playing freshman volleyball. Um, I will say that freshman and varsity are two different sports. <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> and I got to see her uh, spike the ball a couple times, and that was really nice. That was entertaining. Um, I think that's the last of the photos. Okay, great. Then also um, I had an opportunity to visit one elementary, uh, Jeff Miller. He was awesome. And um, I really got to appreciate and see uh, the actual implementation of the changes that we've made and um, with our superintendent with regards to allocations. This was a perfect uh, opportunity for me to see that they originally had 251 allotted allocations but the actuals were 372. So that was awesome for them to know and to feel that they had some help coming in. That was amazing. Um, I also attended uh, Peavine Middle School uh, Elementary as well, and uh, Glenn Duncan with Principal Ryan Smith, and he's always uh, amazing, I appreciate him. Amy Howe at Peavine, um, we stay in contact because unfortunately sometimes she has to call me for other stuff that's happening in the neighborhood as it relates to code enforcement, so I'm happy to always go there and assist her. Um, I also attended last week uh, Children's Cabinet's uh, Youth uh, Mental Health Summit. Um, I want to give a shout out to Annie Zucker. She did a great job, as always, and uh, I got to see our superintendent, and he gave a great speech. We appreciate that, representing very, very well. And then lastly, um, today I attended a funeral for a uh, a champion of education, Mr. Tom Dolan. Uh, we all know him as, a, uh, as an amazing human being who gave so much to the community and who supported our school district so much. Uh, we all know about uh, what he did for the Catholic Church in uh, Sun Valley to help rebuild that church. That was all him, and we deeply appreciate it. Um, I have a lot of experiences with him. He was an amazing human being. Um, I'm going to miss him. I love him. Um, I can't believe that I was actually with him the week prior, and uh, he didn't look too good. I, I thought he was putting on an act so he can get his approval at city council because he was <laughs> visiting the city council to get approval, but um, he, was, he was a beautiful human being, and I'm just appreciative, and I'm very glad that his family continues the same perspectives that he has for community and that they're dedicated to community as well. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I can't top that. Um, that was that was nice. Uh, I'll just briefly. I did have a, a chance to to, um, to visit a couple of our middle schools, Depoli Middle School with Principal Smith, and uh, was escorted by a group of students 
and it was a wonderful visit. Uh, they were really proud of their school and, and highlighted a lot of the classes and what they're doing. And last week I got a chance to tour um, uh, Pine Middle School with Principal Red and her two assistant uh, principals and uh, I, I appreciate um, all the challenges and and positive things that are happening at at, uh, at, at those particular middle schools um, a few weeks ago I did have a chance to attend the balloon breakfast at Mammy Tolls uh, a lot of fun uh, last Saturday evening I spent uh, with uh, President Smith and Trustee Nicolette at the Pure Imagination event for the Education of Alliance of Washoe County uh, in between some of this, I've uh, had a chance to go to some Friday Night Light events, uh, football games. And last Friday was uh, <coughs> Spanish Springs versus Minogue and Spanish Springs lost. <coughs> but uh, it was a, it was a it was a good time. It was a good time. And finally, I do I do appreciate uh, uh, having a little time with the Youth Opioid Summit today. Uh, I showed up just as. Uh, the celebrity uh, uh, Jeremy Renner was leaving stage story of my life um, but uh, the short time I was there along with my colleagues President Smith trustee Nicola trustee Westlake clearly a very enlightening um, experience that I, I continues to remind me of the dangers of synthetic opioids and how easy it is to get in the hands of our youth and I know this is not the time <clears throat> for this discussion but uh, I, at some point I, I'd be love to see our district get these messages out to our, our family somehow and really raise this awareness so that may be something that we can talk about in the future thank you um, well I've had a chance to visit seven schools and I'm going to concentrate on something else and um, one of them is the parent teacher home visitation that I attended and there is that beautiful family Bruno, the young gentleman in the, in the back there on, on the right as I see it, um, attends Clayton Middle School and he's the oldest in his family. His little sister's in front of him and dad's holding the little baby and um, who we have there in the picture are social worker Christina Rodriguez and we had the advisory teacher who's also math and science teacher Gabby Larios and it was such a lovely conversation and I was able to um, use some of my um, previous experience as a home visitor in St. Louis, Missouri. I, I did that for four years and the bonding that this family and these teachers have to support Bruno and not only Bruno but the, the family structure is absolutely a beautiful thing. It is relationship building at its finest and those smiles are all real. Um, I also attended the, um, um, let me see here, Washoe County Youth Mental Health Summit. There were three teen panels. Uh, my goodness sakes, I learned so much from these students. There was a youth adolescent development panel. There was a social media panel and there was athletics, the joys and the stresses of athletics. And these students were absolutely insightful. They were honest, they were kind and they shared their information beautifully. And then, as Trustee Mayberry has said, there were 650 middle and high schoolers at the DEA Opioid Drug Summit this morning, and I learned two terms. I could talk about many things, but two terms that stick in my mind for fentanyl. Number one, DEA is referring to it as drug poisoning, and not overdose, a drug poisoning. And then this is a term that I think we should continue to spread and use. One pill can kill. And it's an absolute fact. I attended the PBS Spotlight Awards where one of our own, Tim Woods, um, band teacher, band director at Swope Middle School won the Extraordinary Educator Award and the an evening of pure magic. And this is what this is, there you go. There it is, there it is. I looked fabulous in my colored wig and all sorts of makeup and somebody at one point said, wow, you look really young. You look like you could be 40. And he said, it was, it must be the makeup. And I thought, I don't know if that's an insult or a compliment, but I'm not wearing that makeup, period, the end, thank you. All right. 
I will hold for one minute while JJ gets the first clip up before my time starts. The little video will play until I talk. Uh, hold on. So I also attended the Education Alliance Evening of Pure Imagination with Vice President Mayberry and Trustee Nicolette, and this is our little video shot. Um, it was absolutely outstanding. Sarah Gobshill and her team put on a fantastic event. I want to thank everybody who attended. <laughs> I, um, I, did, I did not approve the use of that video. <laughs> Also want to say congratulations uh, to our PBS Reno um, extraordinary educator, Tim Wood, and extraordinary student, Sophie Mark, from Reno High School. And want to bring attention and congratulate that Washoe County School District has five of the top ten elementary schools in the entire state of Nevada. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, I spoke to Mr. Clark's government class as part of an electeds panel. Um, I also attended the Youth Mental Health Summit, the um, Moana Springs Aquatic Center ribbon cutting, which I'm very excited about. I met with a group of students, you heard me talk about that before, who um, opened a sustainability club at Galena High School. I joined the Youth Opioid Summit, uh, that was earlier today. And then my last picture is the um, Amazing experience with author Eric Odie. Um, and I want to say thank you to the Reno Rotary and the Sparks Rotary for donating thousands of books to nine Title I schools. Every single student in those schools got a book. And um, Mr. Odie also did um, events at those nine schools uh, as well. And it was just really incredible. And so uh, Dr. Nicola and I attended the event at Rita Cannon Elementary School. And so, my last item. No, it's good. It's good. And I don't know that I'll announce this every year, but your first year is particularly important. So, it is September. It is Hodgkin Lymphoma Awareness Month. I'm wearing my pin, and I'm so pleased to share that I have made the one-year cancer-free mark, which is... <laughs> And oncology and in cancer recovery is incredibly important. And so I just want to say thank you to everyone. When I was first diagnosed, Stanford um, and my oncologist here in Reno really rallied around me. And they uh, gave me all these studies about the impact of purpose-driven work and cancer outcomes. And they told me that my public service would be part of saving my life. And it has been. And it continues to be. And it is an honor to do this work. It fills my soul. It fills me with light. I will not let anyone take my light. And I just want to say thank you so much for all the love that I received. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And so that closes item 4.02. Now I'm going to turn it over to the superintendent. <laughs> President Smith, that's great news. Thank you for sharing that with us this evening, and we're all really happy that that's the case, and we appreciate all your leadership, so thank you very much. Um, this week we had uh, parent-teacher home visits, and uh, we're able to get out to some schools and recognize some exemplary schools, have two people in the audience out there that were joining on those parent-teacher home visits, Mrs. McMaster and Mr. Searcy joining to get the experience and understand what that relationship is about that uh, Trustee Nicolette described. Had our first cup of joe uh, with Joe, and that was a really nice event. Want to say thank you to the communications team and Jay Wood Raw staff. Uh, really a very nice visit. Uh, school visits have been exceptional. Um, there is great work happening in our schools, and I could list all of those schools, and I know we're, uh, we're getting late into the evening, but there's some, some great school visits. Um, the other thing that uh, is, is, is well worth noting is that we have uh, seven new five-star schools this year. And so we were able to get out and award all of those schools and recognize those staffs. And so I think that's something to be proud of uh, as a school district. And then lastly, just speak to UNR's staff appreciation for our uh, educators. Uh, they reached out to um, Washoe County School District and invited uh, members to join them. Uh, we had two schools recognized uh, during the, the game on Saturday. 
Uh, and so it was just real nice to continue to build our partnership with UNR and uh, be able to establish that, that appreciation and that uh, collaboration with uh, higher ed. So good week, and uh, thank you, everyone. Wonderful. All right, everyone, that closes item 4.03 and section four in its entirety. As a reminder, I've already opened section five and we have already done item 5.01, our public comment. That brings me now to item 5.02, the announcement of our next meeting, which is October 22nd, 2024. So for those that are wondering, we are not having the meeting during the week of fall break, um, but our next meeting again will be October 22nd, 2024. And then now, oh my gosh, I shut my computer. It is 7.49 p.m. and I adjourn this meeting. Thank you so much.